right. Looks like we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much-anticipated reunion between Dr. Dino and Wade the Wizard. The Wade the Wizard and Dr. Dino debate saga continues, and tonight, evolution is on trial. So before we get into the debate itself, uh, let's kind of break the ice a bit, get to know Wade and Kent for the audience, any new subscribers, anybody who might not be familiar. And Wade, it's been a little while since you've been here, so why don't we start with you. Wade, how have you been? Thanks for doing another debate in this series and a little bit about your channel. Um, all right, well, I'm Wade the Wizard, and hello to any fellow wizards who might be watching. My YouTube channel is The Wizard Show, and it's just a, kind of an all over the place creative outlet for me um, when I have the time or when I get around to it. Um, yeah, I just got back from a six week expedition in Alaska for my job, my other job, when I'm not a wizard. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll kind of mention that more later in the debate. Okay, wait, I appreciate it. Um, the original Kent versus Wade debate trilogy has gotten a ton of good feedback. So for anybody in the audience who has not yet seen that, I've got it linked in the des uh, description box for people to check out. Okay, Dr. Hoven, good to have you back as well, brother. How you been? A little bit about yourself, a little bit about Dal. Well, thank you. It's good to be back again. Uh, my name's Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years, taught high school science and math 15 years. I defend the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. God made everything, everything, stars, dinosaurs, everything in six days, like he said he did in the book of Exodus and in several other places. So yeah, I believe the Bible's true. We have Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. People come visit all the time. You're all invited. Wait, you're invited. We'll give you the tour. We'd love to have you, really, seriously. Come on down. All right, sounds good. Maybe debate number five will be live and in person at Dinosaur Adventureland. So with that, I do want to let the audience know we're going to have an interesting format tonight. We're going to be going uh, one argument after another. So what Wade will do is, you know, take three to five minutes. If he needs a little more, that's fine as well. He'll present argument one. We'll let Kent respond. They can go back and forth a little bit for a few minutes in terms of, you know, discussing that argument. Then we're going to move on. So for an hour, we're going to make sure that we touch on uh, each point, each argument. Once we reach the hour mark, as we have been doing, we're going to jump right to the audience Q&A. We've been getting a good 30 minutes now per debate on audience questions. So please make sure you're tagging me either at Standing for Truth or at Donnie, and that way I won't miss it. Okay, so Wade, what we're going to do then is uh, give you the floor for your first uh, argument and your presentation of it, and then we'll go from there. So Wade, the floor is yours. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Looks good. Oh, this is a quick I think you... I think you might have exited it, Wade. It was up there, and then you might have oh, accidentally yeah. clicked stop share. I think there's a way you can show it and not have it be there. So let me try that again. Sorry. No worries. Oh, yeah. So I just want to hide that. So you can still see my screen. Yes. Yeah. All right. As a quick overview, hopefully today we can talk about fossils, geology, taxonomy, speciation, rainbows, and common ancestry. A lot to cover. Um, evolution, its definition, is the change in the heritable traits of biological populations over successive generations. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> Nitro, my, I hope, hopefully you can't hear my dog in the background making too much noise. But evolution is making babies that are slightly different and um, some of them survive a little better. Now, as evolution is on trial, imagine we had, uh, you know, your typical murder trial. And if we were to bring forth just one piece of evidence, we might wrongfully convict, um, you know, the wrong person. 
However, if we took that piece of evidence and we put it with all of the other evidence, then we would get a better picture. We could probably make a better um, verdict. So with uh, evolution, oops, with evolution, if we look at just one piece of evidence, like homologous anatomy, um, we could conclude that all life came from a single life uh, common ancestry, or we could even conclude that God did it. God designed everything like this. We could wrongfully convict the wrong person. But it's not until we look at all the evidence for evolution that we can get a better picture of it, right? So just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about just a few little pieces today, starting with fossils. Kent Hovind says, you can't tell anything from a fossil except it died. And I'm going to tell you why that's wrong. So there's, you're familiar with paleontology, which is the study of bones. There's also paleoecology. This is the, essentially the study of ecology or the plants, animals, the climate, the biology um, a long time ago. Um, so they, they look at the life cycles, the life living interactions, natural environment, communities, the manner and death of burial and such like that. Um, so evolutionary, more specifically, we have evolutionary paleoecology uses data from fossils and other evidence to examine how organisms and their environments change throughout time. Okay. So science is what we know, what we can observe. And if we, in nature, if we observe one animal, we know that there is a population of that animal. Never has one animal existed by itself. So if we find one fossil, that means we know there was a population of this animal. They didn't all fossilize, or we haven't found them, but we know that a whole population existed. And... The thing that we know about populations is they reproduce, they make babies, and we've never seen an exception where populations don't produce uh, offspring that are slightly different, that are selected for in nature. So also if we find a fossil, we know that it had a baby. Um, and yeah, so we know that evolution is reproduction, variation, and selection. And so if we find a fossil, we would expect it to follow, there, there wouldn't be an exception. Um, depending on where we find the fossils, even accounting for continental drift, we can determine where these creatures lived. If we look at their teeth, we can determine, did they eat plants or animals? Um, there might be indications of a broken bone or, or tooth marks. We can determine how they died. Maybe they're found in an ash field and they were buried by a volcano or they fell into a, a boggy marsh. So, uh, yeah, and then <clears throat> looking at the structure of their skeleton, we can know that this guy walked on two legs, this guy walks on four legs, this creature is capable of flying, this one crawls on its belly or slithers on its belly, and then we got animals that can swim, so we know how they moved. Depending on what layer we found them in, we can determine what time they lived. Um, depending on when the creature was fossilized during its life cycle, we can determine if it has some kind of, um, we can determine more about their life cycle. There's also paleoclimatology. Um, so this, this is uh, based on the, the climate of the time. So there's a, there's a whole field of study with a lot of evidence as far as uh, how we understand what the climate was back then. There's also taphonomy, which is the study of how organisms decay and become fossilized or preserved in the paleont paleontological record. Um, so yeah, like we we it's a very well studied science as how things break down, how things fossilize. So when we find a fossil, we know that a population existed, they reproduced, they evolved, where they lived, what they ate, how they died, how they moved, 
uh, we can determine their life cycle, their ecosystem. We can determine a lot about a creature, more than just it died. So um, with that, stop screen. Um, we can turn it over to Kent and he can tell us why, why I'm wrong or apologize and, and uh, it's okay to, to admit that you're wrong. You, you can just uh, admit that you're wrong if you want to, yeah. Okay, Wade, that uh, completes your uh, six minute opening argument, argument number one, the fossil record. I appreciate it and thank you for the visual. So now we're gonna hand it over to Kent and Kent, you have a six minute uh, response pertaining to uh, Wade's first argument here. So whenever you're ready, Kent, the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, thank you, Wade. I appreciate that. You also are welcome to admit when you're wrong, okay? Uh, what is science? As you mentioned, I was, I was glad to hear you give the definition you have. I think I wrote it down quickly enough. Science is what we know, what we can observe. Very good, Wade. We, do, we know cows produce cows. We observe it. We do not know cows came from a rock that we don't know, that we don't observe. You believe animals change. You slipped in with your list there from fossils. We know they evolve. You don't know any such thing. Okay, science, what we know, the knowledge gained using observation, experimentations to describe and explain the world around us. We know cows produce cows, make an observation. Wow, the cow had a baby cow. Develop an idea, why does that happen? Oh, maybe there's genetics involved. Think of experiments to test it. Well, let's crossbreed the cows, okay? Predict what'll happen. I predict they'll make cows again. Observe what happens. Sure enough, they made a cow. Modify the idea if the prediction is wrong. Nope, my prediction was right, so we're done. It worked. So cows produce cows, it must be some kind of genetic. Keep breeding them and see if it works again. Babies will be cows and the babies grow up and make more cows, always cows. Seems to work every time. That is science, what we can observe. You slipped in that we see them evolve. No, you don't, you don't see any fossil evolve. All you see is the fossil, it died, okay? Let me go back to home here. Fossils, okay, since you wanna make that your first point. Uh, transitional fossils, okay. Microevolution, evolutionary change within a species or small group of organisms, especially over a short period. Transitional fossils, really? No fossil could count as being transitional. Your definition, Wade, was exactly correct. Science is what we know, what we can observe. I agree. You do not prove the fossil at any children that lived, okay? You might believe it was part of a population. I believe that's a reasonable assumption, but you could not technically prove that. If an animal is able to evolve and change to something else, that one that changed to something else is now no longer that part of that population, is it? Does the whole population have to change at the same time? Or can the rest of them keep on being cows while this one is changing to a bird or whatever it's gonna to change to? And if one of them is slowly changing to a bird, it's no longer part of that population, and who's it gonna marry? You got a real problem there, son, okay? You could never prove it had kids different from itself. You can believe that. You find a fossil, you don't know it had children that were different than itself. You slip that in, they evolve. You don't know that. You can't possibly know such a thing. No animal today can produce kids other than its same kind. So why would you believe a bone in the dirt could do it? Why would you believe fossils could do something no animal today can do? No living plant or animal is able to do what you say happened. And you say you can de deduce that it happened by digging up a bone out of the dirt. You cannot possibly prove such a thing. If it happened millions of years ago, we'll do it again. We got plenty of scientists today. We could do it in the laboratory. Make your cow produce a non-cow. Okay. Transitional fossils help scientists bridge the gaps of life. This is absolute pure baloney. PBS. I won't tell you what that stands for. Okay. Resulting in a picture of gradual evolution over millions of years. Aha, tetrapod fossils. According to modern theory, evolution theory, all populations of organisms are in transition. Oh, really? Well, then show me one. Show me any animal today that is evolving. I'd like to see it. I wish I had wings. Ever, anybody ever wanted to go someplace really fast and wish you had wings and could fly there? Many times, man, I'm gonna be late. I, I wish I had wings. Why don't we start evolving wings? Huh? Are there transitional fossils? At least hundreds, possibly thousands of transitional fossils have been found so far by researchers. The exact count is unclear because some lineages of organisms are obviously continuously evolving. This is absolute baloney, okay? Not true at all. Tell everybody at Live Science, I'll debate all of them. Half my brain tied behind my back and one eye closed and one foot off the floor, just to make it fair. All of them, okay? Are there any intermediate fossils? 
looking all the way back, stop, stop, stop. You can't look back. Your whole theory is based on the idea that the geologic column exists, which it does not exist anywhere. And the deeper you go, the further back you go. The whole thing is baloney. All the layers formed at one time in one year during one big flood. We, we did a couple of weeks ago, we did one on uh, Whack an Atheist here on a channel Wednesday, uh, what, about a week and a half ago, uh, showing the, the layers of the earth form horizontally as the tide, the moon lifting the water up and down with the tide is causing the water to rush in and out. Layers form sideways, multiple layers at a time. You guys think the top layer is younger. Where did it come from? Outer space? You got all these layers to the earth. Are they being added from outer space? Where are they coming from? They're all on the earth at the same time. There is no geologic column. You don't go back 375 million years. You got you talk about imagination to be a wizard with your imaginary fish you caught in the river. Wait, you're imagining that you can go back in time. You can't go back. All the bones, all the fossils we find exist in the present. All of them exist right now. Okay, you're not going back in time. You're picking up a rock that, from something that buried. Okay, let's see. There's an intermediate fossil that represents the transition of vertebrate life from, to water on land. Oh, Tiktaalik, I see. Discovered in 2004, an ancient fish, really, lobe fin fish. Tiktaalik does not count as a transitional fossil. You couldn't prove it had any kids that lived. You sure couldn't prove it had kids different from itself. No animal today can do this. Why do you think a fossil can do it? And there are some lobe fin fish today. Are they, moving, are they transitioning into something else? Why don't you get some of the lobe fin fish that are alive today and make them grow legs? That would be science. Doesn't happen. Sorry. It's okay to admit you're wrong. Wait, go ahead. Next point. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dino, for that six-minute response. Wade, we're going to give you a roughly one-minute or so rebuttal. And so whenever you're ready, go ahead, Wade. Um, okay. So... Um, there's a number of things I wanted to, I meant to make a note, but um, so we've observed, we, we've never, I would say, all right, evolution is reproduction, slight variation, and selection. So I, I look like my parents, that's heritable traits, uh, that's reproduction, but I'm not an exact clone. I don't look identical, okay? So that's that's variation. And selection. I don't have any kids. My uh, sister has five kids, and that's that's evolution. We've we've never observed uh, any organism that has is not evolving. So we can safely assume that uh, in the past, if we find the bones of a, an organism, that it also evolved. Um, uh, transitional fossils. So. Real quick note about that, like you you agree that a wolf and a coyote have a common ancestor. If we if we found a fossil and it looked, it was just like right in between. It wasn't quite a wolf's uh, skeleton. It wasn't quite a coyote's skeleton. Um, it was right in between. You you ha can either assume that. Um, if we assume that that's a, a totally unique species, then that would mean there were just multiple magnitude of species that existed and then uh, went extinct. I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else was, I, I think that's enough for now. Go ahead and I don't know what my time was, but. Oh, you're good. You're good. Pretty much two minutes. So no worries. I know time flies by when we're rebutting points. So Wade, thank you for that rebuttal. Kent, we'll hand it over to you. You got roughly two minutes as well. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Wait, if we found a fossil that look, appeared to be in between, like Tiktaalik, okay, it looks like it has little legs before the fin starts. Somebody thinks, oh, that's in between. A, it may be something that's already existing someplace else on the planet, like they've now found. There are other fish still have limbs like that or it may be something that went extinct. You do not know it was changing to something else. You know it died, and I would agree with you, it probably came from a population of similar creatures like that, okay? Maybe it died because it couldn't survive because it was changing. There are some animals like the flies that develop four wings and can't even fly. They don't survive except in the laboratory. So maybe this thing that was starting to evolve died. I think the chances of it dying are much greater than the chances of it living and taking over the whole population. So. 
you said evolution is reproduction with variation and then selection. And you are different than your sister and she has a bunch of kids. That's wonderful. That's great. I would be willing to bet you're all human. I'd be willing to bet a three-year-old can tell you you're all human. Okay? Three-year-old will say they're the same kind. They're all human. So, and I think all the animals in the world can identify their own kind. Turn them all loose into the woods. The coyotes look for the coyotes. They don't look for the pine trees to mate with. Not at all. The squirrels look for squirrels. They know. They don't even know what they look like. But they know what their mate should look like. It's amazing, isn't it? You'd almost think it was designed. Okay. Anyway, I, I'm sorry I disagree. Uh, evolution. You said, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, they evolved. You never observed an organism that did not evolve. Well, who made that statement up? Wade, where, give me some evidence for that. I don't believe you for one second. There is, is that chocolate under that aluminum foil? That, Wait, okay. <laughs> You've never observed an organism that did not evolve? That's a propaganda statement. That's not science. Show me some evidence. I want to see any animal evolving. What's your best evidence? Go ahead. Okay, Kent, thank you for that response. So, Wade, as per the format, you can either give a quick rebuttal and have a, a really short back and forth with Kent on this first point, or we can move uh, into you presenting your second argument for the night. So I'll leave that up to you, Wade. How do you want uh, to proceed? Yeah, I think we'll, I want to be able to make sure we cover everything. So we'll go ahead and move on to geology. Okay. Whenever you're ready, we are now for the audience sake. I want to let them know we're now on round two of the debate and therefore argument two. And so Wade, go ahead. Take your time presenting it, and we'll go for we'll go from here. Okay, so Kent likes to say that the geologic layers are the same age. It's just six thousand years all the way down, right? Uh, so I'm Wade the Wizard. I was born in 1988. I can either say that I'm I'm 34 years old, or I can say. I was born 34 years ago. Both ways are correct. Usually, usually I'll just say I'm 34 years old. When a geologist discovers a layer, they can say this layer formed X years ago, or they can say this layer is X years ago. Both are correct. Typically, geologists will use the second say, oh, this is this many years old. <clears throat> so, um, okay. This was, uh, so with geotech coring, I had the great opportunity to go up to, way up to the top of Prudhoe Bay, Alaska for six weeks to do some coring. We drilled almost 3,000 feet into the earth. And while I was there, I had a great opportunity to, um, there was a team of geologists who worked for the USGS, the uh, Geologic Survey. And they had decades of experience of field work and um, just just absolutely brilliant people. And I and I talked to them. I had a chance to talk to them about how do we know that these layers are different ages, and how do we know that they're old? And they talked about um, petrology, which is the study of how rocks form. You've got igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, how they form over time. We it's very well understood. There's the principles of stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is is basically the study of how layers form, and we have the law of superposition. These are the uh, Steno's laws of stratigraphy. Um, so law of superposition, law of horizontality, law of cross-cutting relationships law of lateral continuity and these are all um, relative dating techniques so again law of superposition we know that the oldest layer is always at the bottom youngest layers are on top um, or I, I should say just for clarification uh, the layers on the bottom were formed earlier or long more <laughs> long ago than the layers on the top. All right, anyway. You have cross-cutting relationships that show that the geologic feature that cuts another is younger than the two features. So uh, say F right here, that's going to be younger than B and C. 
We have the principle of intrusive relationships. Basically, if if there's some kind of uh, like a volcanic um, inlet or uh, intrusion, we know that that's younger. There's the law of included fragments. So we know that the rocks inside of a glob are going to be older than the entire glob. There's the principle principle of faunal succession so or plants or animals floral fauna um, we've always found certain fossils of animals and plants in specific layers all around the earth we've never seen an exception to that uh, in fact so biostratigraphy that's uh, this whole uh, the and plants and animals in the layers this is one of the best evidences for biological evolution because it shows a change over time. Uh, there's the whole study of petrology or um, petroleum geology, looking at how coal, rock, gas, those things are formed. Um, it takes a really long time to form coal. Uh, there's also magnostratigraphy. So basically, every 1,000 to 10,000 years, the North Pole flips to the South, South flips to the North. And when the poles flip, there's a signature left in, um, in certain rocks, like in uh, metamorphic rocks. So it, basically like a little tiny compasses, it'll show this switching. We have the science of weathering, of erosion and deposition, or, um, yeah, we got that. We've got uh, paleoclimatology again. Um, and then, so now that was all just relative dating techniques. And then we have uh, exact dating techniques. So this is, we got a bunch of different materials that that decay over time. And as you can see, their half-life is measured in billions of years. And we have everything from 0.7 billion years to 106 billion years. So uh, there's a whole bunch of different scientific fields related to geology, who study the layers of the earth. There are all these different ge uh, geologic societies throughout the world. We have 51 geology organizations, which is composed of thousands of scientists who have worked really, who have dedicated their lives to publishing scientific experiments that have been peer reviewed and verified. And they all come to the same conclusion. Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the layers are different ages. And then we have this guy who has a little sand toy who thinks otherwise. So um, I'm gonna turn the time over to Kent mm -hmm. to explain why every scientist is wrong and you're right. Okay, Wade, thank you for your uh, presentation there on argument number two for the debate. That was exactly six minutes. And so good job on the time. And Dr. Hoven, we're gonna hand it over to you now and you have six minutes for your response. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Wade. No, all the scientists aren't wrong and I'm right. A lot of scientists agree with me and they're also right, okay? But the ones that disagree are wrong, okay? If you shake up a jar of sand, rocks, gravel, clay, like easy to do, go get a sample out of your yard, put some water in it, shake it up. I would be willing to bet it would settle into layers. Let me ask you a question. We shook this thing up right here. We end up with a layer of gravel at the bottom and then sand and then silt and then clay. Boy, that's exactly like the gravel pit we live in here. These gravel layers that start here in Alabama go all the way to North Carolina, 500 miles, seven layers of gravel. They were digging out here. There are thousands of gravel pits along here where they dig gravel out in the Southeast. Is the gravel older than the clay? The clay's on top. Is it older? No. It's, you can put them all in the jar and shake them up and in seconds they separate. My little sand toy teaches a great lesson. You haven't got it yet. If you flip it over, it'll form multiple layers every time. Got one right here. Now look at this. This top layer is 6 million years old, and this one down here is 44 million years old. Anybody can tell that. All the scientists agree. This is so insane. Layers formed rapidly. Actually, the layers formed sideways. It's because of what's called tidal pumping. 
The moon pulls the water up on the earth and makes a bump called the high tide. If the sun is helping it, you get a spring tide. If the, help, if the sun is 90 degrees perpendicular to it, it cancels some of the effect and you get a neap tide. I taught her science 15 years. I'll be glad to have a quiz against you or anybody else on these topics, okay? The tide is held there like a magnet while the earth spins around. So the water, to, to people on earth, the water's going up and down, up and down, up and down. The moon doesn't care, just holding its bump right there underneath it. So this bump, Five feet in Florida, 30, uh, 50 feet up at the Bay of Fundy where you were. I think the highest tides at the Bay of Fundy is like 100 feet, 106 or something, tidal change. Okay. So if the water's going up and down to fill the tidal bump, it's also going laterally in and out to fill the bump. Okay. We're at 31 degrees north latitude here in Lenox, Alabama. So you can do all the math on that. At the North Pole, the Earth is spinning zero miles an hour. At the equator, it's going 1,037.6 miles an hour. Okay. Oh, 0.58. Gonna get technical. Depends on your altitude. Never mind. Okay. So here in Lenox, Alabama, we're 31 degrees north. We're turning almost 886 miles an hour right here, right now. So if the water was going into that bump, the tidal bump, for a few hours maybe, at about 800 miles an hour, not all the water, you're only adding 200 feet to what's already there. But enough water molecules are going, you're gonna get lateral movement of the water and the sediments. And it's going to form multiple layers sideways at the same time. Watch the video, it's been on the YouTube for years, Experiments in Stratification. We played some of it a few nights ago. Was it last Wednesday? Look that up, would you, Randall? Last Wednesday, Whack an Atheist, a week ago today, go to Kent, well, it's still up there, Kent Hovind Official, we're in YouTube jail for another day. Uh, anyway, so, <clears throat> so the fossils on top could actually be older than the fossil at the bottom because the layers are forming laterally with each ingoing and outgoing tidal uh, surge. Ah. Yes, my sand toy teaches a great lesson. This is why the water moving sideways, rolling all the rocks against each other, would round them off like a rock tumbler does. Before, after. Wow, rock tumbler. We got one out here. You can put rocks in there. You know, gravel all over the world is rounded. Wade, come to Alabama. We will give you one. We have rounded rocks here, and they form into layers because of sideways movement of the water. So if all the geologists believe, you have, uh, let's see, a uh, whole bunch of organizations, how many were 51 geological organizations? You contact every one of them, tell them I will debate all of them at the same time. I get half the time. I want them to explain if the top layer is younger, where did it come from? Your analogy about your age, 34 uh, years old versus formed 34 years ago, fails miserably when it comes to rocks, okay? The layers are all in position at the same time we're looking at them. They see layers and they assume different ages. This all started <clears throat> a couple hundred years ago with a guy named Steno, and, and then was uh, uh, a couple other people really pushed this idea, and nobody caught it. They said, well, the top layer is obviously the youngest. No, stop right there. No, it's not. Not if the multiple layers form horizontally at the same time. They all progress. Watch experiments in stratification, Wade. It's an old video from some French guy or sp speaking you know, Cajun or something, but it's excellent scientific research. Sorry, Randall, I know you speak Cajun too, but okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm sorry, you've been lied to. There is no geologic And you said the north-south pole flips. This is absolutely not true. What happened, they measured the magnetic intensity in rocks across the mid-Atlantic ridge and found stronger, weaker intensity. They never found them reversed. There is no known way for the magnetic pole to reverse. It's pure imagination. It's stronger, weaker magnetism and somebody drew a line through the middle of the sine wave and said, oh, everything above here is north and everything below is south. Well, if I lined up all the people in the world and took an average height of, say, five foot six, does that mean everybody under five foot six is down in the ground? No, they're, they're less than average, okay? That's all. So the, there, there are no magnetic reversals. I challenge you on that, Wade. Prove that, okay? There are stronger and weaker magnetism, but no reversal. You need to watch my whole video series. I'll send you one if you'd like. All right, uh, let's see, 29 seconds left. Did I cover everything? Um, your 30-foot core sample, I'd be willing to bet when you, or 3,000-foot core sample. I lived in East Texas, took core samples all the time, in the oil field there. I didn't, but I, my, students, my students' parents did. I'd be willing to bet they found lots of layers to the earth. And I'd be willing to challenge them that all those layers formed in one big flood by the shaking up and down of the tidal surge. It's sideways movement forming the layers. The layers are not different ages, Wade. Sorry. Okay. Kent, thank you so much for that six-minute response to Wade the Wizard's second argument for the debate. So, Wade, we're going to hand it over to you for a rebuttal. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Just make sure to unmute yourself. 
All right. So, um, Kent, I want you to do an experiment. I want you to get a jar. I want you to take some gravel, some sand, some dirt, and put it into that jar and some water. And then I want you to add some plants and animals. Okay, don't actually do this, okay, because, uh, you know, <laughs> this is a bad, bad situation. But if we were to take plants and animals and the gravel and dirt and shake it up, do you, why, like, do you really think that these animals would be in a specific order? Like this, this animal, um, like the Neanderthal or what, you know, say it's going to be in a layer below human fossils or, or kind of whatever, like, uh, the, there's only, the only difference between some of these animals are just slight physical changes. So it doesn't make sense what, why we shake up a jar with plants and animals in it. And we would expect this, uh, flannel, uh, or, you know, this, this ordering of the fossils. Um, and I mean, uh, I've seen animals that die in water and usually they float to the top. Okay, so why aren't all the fossils at the top? Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so you also talked about yeah, plants. I, I mean, I think that's that's interesting to think that you know when you when you factor in plants and animals into your jar experiment, it doesn't really work. Like we have ancient ancient plants in the lowest levels that are is, is essentially the exact same kind of plant, but it's just changed over time. Um, you talked about debating all of the scientists, all of the ge geologists, and I wanna emphasize that scientists, they don't debate. They do experimentation, they publish their findings, and then they can have their fellow scientists um, peer review it, verify it, and either confirm it or provide evidence that will disprove it. They don't um, debate. Uh, I think, what was that last thing? I don't know. All right, we can go ahead and move on. Okay, Wade, thank you for that response. Just a little bit over two minutes. And so, Kent, we will give you, let's say, between two and three minutes, and then we'll move on to argument number three. So, Kent, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, let's put some plants and animals in the jar and shake it up. Let's get a really big jar, like the whole planet, covered in water by Noah's flood. You shake it up, you're gonna find them sorted into layers a little bit. By the way, here's a coelacanth still swimming around. But the textbooks still teach it was 360 million years ago. How could it be 360 million years old when they're still around? I know, a wizard poofed one from the past into the present. I got it, okay. This whole geologic column does not exist. All over the world, there's a plant, lots of thousands of them, petrified trees in the standing position running through all these layers. Huh, trees only here, dead trees around Alabama only stand up two or three or four years and they fall down, okay? But petrified trees in the standing position running through all these layers that you guys worship and say they're different ages is, is evidence that it's not true. Yellowstone finally had to put a fence around the one there, got the couple that they got there because people kept picking rocks off it, to pick pieces off the petrified tree, okay? Petrified trees in the standing position are very common, running through all these layers. Is this just a local flood? Up here in North Alabama, there's a coal mine where they have lots of petrified trees standing up, running through seams of coal. And coal, you said coal takes a long time to form. Wait, coal can be formed in the laboratory in 20 minutes. Google, how fast can coal be formed? You put wood under heat and pressure, it turns to coal, 20 minutes. I think the flood would cause enormous amounts of heat and pressure on the layers. The deeper the layers get, the more they push down. Cubic foot of rock weighs about, what, uh, 100 pounds, depending on what type of rock it is. You get a whole bunch of them stacked up, it gets heavy. So I think all the coal formed in Noah's flood and all the layers formed uh, in one year, not vertically, horizontally, the water moving back and forth, there's gonna be sediment settling out, but it's not coming from outer space. You guys don't get it. The Mary Lee Formation and Blue Creek Formation of coal up here in North Alabama have petrified trees standing up, running through the layers. But if you look at sample H and say, wow, sample A and sample H match a few layers. Those two steams of coal must have formed before the wood could rot. Yeah, like maybe in less than a couple of years. Google Specimen Ridge, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, there's 27 consecutive layers of tree bro broken off. This was a flood did this. 
30-foot petrified tree in Cookville, Tennessee. Top and bottom are in different seams of coal, one tree. Coal's always on top of clay. That's pretty poor soil to support a tree to grow, okay? Joggins, Nova Scotia has all kinds of trees petrified standing up. Just Google it. You guys don't want to answer this. There is no, there's no answer that matches your religion. Wait, the flood formed all those layers. I'm sorry. Uh, where did I leave off here? Oh, I want to get to slide number 574, right there. Okay. Why are they in different layers? Animals, first of all, they maybe they're sorted based upon habitat. I bet clams would be found at the bottom because they already live at the bottom when the flood started. They're the first ones buried. Birds are found on top generally because they're the last ones to dry in a flood. I bet a lot of things would cause the separation of the, though they're not all separated. Lots of animals are found tangled together. But generally, they would be sorted with, by habitat, by mobility, by intelligence, and by body density. Body density would be an obvious one. In a flood with everything drowning, floating around in the dead, dead carcasses, the more dense ones would go to the bottom, the lighter ones at the top. This is not evidence for millions of years, one changing to another. The, the, an acronym they use is FARM, fish, amphibial, rep, rep, fish, Amphibian Reptile Mammal. They claim the fish turn to amphibians, amphibians turn to reptiles, reptiles turn to mammals. And that's the only way they can think of it. No, a, I'm sorry, Wade, there is no evolution of any animal or plant to a different kind. Go ahead and put them in a jar. They might separate based upon body density, based upon habitat, not based upon evolution. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Ken, thank you so much for that re uh, rebuttal to Wade the Wizard's uh, second argument for this debate. Wade, are we um, now moving on to argument number three? Um. Well, let me just make a note. Maybe we'll come. We'll circle back. There were a few things I wanted to to mention. Um, let me just make a note. So you, I wanted to talk about your your petrified trees and um, and coal and okay. But we're gonna go ahead and jump to taxonomy, which is classifications of different. Um, organisms. So, okay, you're um, good to go, Wade. Taxonomy. <clears throat> uh, so, Kent often likes to say that humans are not apes, right? This is akin to saying that tomatoes are not fruits. Technically, they're, uh, I mean, we, we typically refer to them as vegetables, but scientifically, they are cl classified as fruits. Uh, I know Kent Hoven has no problem, or I, at least I don't think he has any problem classifying humans as mammals, because we, you know, we have mammary glands, uh, the neocortex in the brain, um, we have fur, hair, we have... Uh, unique ear bones that's shared amongst all other mammals um, now if we look at apes the the family of apes <clears throat> excuse me um, we have large brains we have visual acuity we have color vision no tails flexible shoulders we have similar teeth we have very dexterous or flexible hands with uh, these cool thumbs. Um, we're a very social species with similar behaviors. And we have long, longer lifespans. We're intelligent, tool using communicators who can transmit diseases amongst other species. So, all these similarities, and yet uh, for some reason, Kent doesn't think we're classified as apes. Um, so even though we share more similar DNA than a wolf and a coyote, he'll, he'll say that a wolf and coyote came from a similar ancestor, but humans do not. We have the fusion of chromosome two. We have the uh, endogenous retroviruses, which are um, at, in the same location in our DNA, which we've, we've talked about this before, 205. Uh, there's also nanog uh, pseudogenes. These are basically errors that are copied over, and they're in the exact same location, which can only happen, uh, or at least I'll say we've only observed this scientifically 
through reproduction, through uh, heritage. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry, am I? Uh, all right, let's see what else we got here. We have very similar bone structures. Uh, I mentioned our teeth earlier, very similar teeth. We have these flexible shoulders. Kent, why do we have such flexible shoulders? Like, it doesn't really, we don't really climb trees anymore, but maybe if our ancestors were really good at climbing trees, it'd make sense. Um, why do we have hair on our arms? It doesn't make sense. You know, apes have hair on their arms. Also, we have goosebumps, okay? So, like, uh, it doesn't make sense to have goosebumps when you're scared or when you're cold. It doesn't really serve a purpose or have a function. But for our uh, ape ancestors, it helped them appear larger or, or gave them better insulation. Um, so basically, like everything in taxonomy says that humans are also a category of an ape family. And... Um, I believe, yeah, then we'll go on to the next one, but I'll go ahead and stop a little short and turn the time over to Kent. Okay, Wade the Wizard, thank you so much for that presentation on argument number three for the debate. We are now going to hand it over to Kent for a response uh, of up to, let's say, six minutes, and then we'll go from there. So Dr. Dino, whenever you're ready, brother. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Wade. I appreciate that. The family trees that are often shown in textbooks will show that humans are related to all kinds of things, such as tomato. It's interesting you, must, interesting you mentioned tomato, uh, fruit or vegetable. I don't care. Okay. I don't think the tomato cares what we call them or how we classify them. Okay. But uh, the textbooks do have lines connecting all the life forms. They got the shark is related to the fern and to the starfish and to the octopus. This is what the kids are being taught. Now, if a protozoa, a single cell creature, turns into a biology teacher quickly, that would be a fairy tale. If it turns into a biology teacher slowly, that would be modern science in your estimation. You believe a single cell creature has turned into everything. This is the evolution religion in a nutshell. So I have to ask, Wade, do you believe you are related to a jellyfish and a tomato? There you go, you got them on the chart together. You believe you're related to them, Wade? Are you related to a tomato? Oh, let me just unmute Wade if he wants to answer. Okay, Wade, sure. feel yep. free to answer during Ken's time. Well, oh, and I mean, I just rather that can't talk about why humans are not classified as apes. That was the topic I was trying to convey. Okay. Well. All of the so-called ape men, cave men, some people used to call them in that. There was the world's most wanted cave man for a while. They finally found him. Uh, all the cave men have been discredited to my knowledge. Plus, you don't know that you find a bone in the dirt. It had any children that are different. The famous Nebraska man and his wife were shown together. All they found was one tooth. How on earth do you tell what his wife looks like from his tooth? I want to hear about that one. This is, this is the kind, they're so desperate for their propaganda to be considered science that, oh, look at everything changing. They found just a few foot bones and made up a whole skeleton over it. How about the footprints? All they find. Let's see. The form of the foot was exactly the same as ours. Wow. National Pornographic put an article about it. About This is the same as a human footprint. Russell Tuttle, University of Chicago, said these 70, they studied 70 barefoot people that go barefoot all their life and said they're the same as these footprints we found in this rock that is supposed to be uh, 3.75 million years old based on the dumb geologic column, the way they date things, okay? Well, if there's normal, perfectly normal human footprints from 3.75 million years ago, that discredits all of the so-called transitional fossils between apes and humans. There are similarities between apes and humans because the same designer made us. I think we have flexible shoulders because I like to be able to grab things at all different angles, okay? I like to hang from branches once in a while. I think tree trimmers have to do that occasionally. The fact that apes like it and we like it does not mean we're related. I don't know how you can't get this. I'm sorry, okay? They added a toe separation in the article about uh, from Mary Leakey uh, about National Pornographic. They added this toe separation to make it look like this animal can gra grasp a limb with its hind feet. Monkeys can. I'd bet five bucks you can't. Tell you what, Wade, let me see you hang upside down by your feet barefoot from a branch. 
I suggest you pick a low branch, okay? It's just all this stuff is baloney. All the Australopithecines are more different from apes and humans than most are from each other. So I'm sorry, there is no evidence of evolution from apes to humans. There are humans today that act like apes, and some are dumber than apes, okay? But they are not related. You can believe that if you want, and I know you want to, but it's not true. You've been brainwashed, okay? Does that answer your question about the taxonomy and apes? Now, are you related to a tomato? Go ahead, wait, i got to hear this. Uh, well, I wanted to... <laughs> Let's see. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay, so... Um, like I, I mentioned flexible shoulders for a reason, because uh, as we've always observed in, in nature is that all organisms reproduce with slight variation. So we would, we, we um, it, it's just, we, when we see similar traits, we can, um, I mean, like when we've seen observed uh, organisms evolve, they're they're born with just slightly different traits. So if we have similar traits, we can uh, conclude that we we had a common ancestor. Um, I guess maybe I'll kind of flip it up a little bit because my next or my last point was this. Um, uh, common ancestry kind of thing the whole what what did you ask this time if i'm related to a tomato or what yeah the the, the family trees in the textbook show everything related to everything all life yeah. forms are related back to a, so i'm they they have a tomato on there and a a human do you believe that's accurate the textbooks teach we're all related came from a common ancestor do you have a common ancestor with a tomato um so yeah well <clears throat> Should we just go ahead and, I don't know if Kent wants a, a quick rebuttal or should we just jump into my last Well, topic? let me jump in here real quick, Wade. Mm -hmm. Your your third argument had a few different points mixed in with it. Was there any one specific point that you wanted uh, Kent to address real quick before we move on to argument number four? I know you brought up, you know, ERVs. Well, fusion, I, I, think pseudo I would love to know why we have goosebumps. Why we have goosebumps? Why do we get goosebumps when we're cold or scared? Go ahead, Kent, if you wanted to address that. Well, I think uh, anybody who studies anatomy would know a goosebump is a little succulent called a sphincter muscle, a very specialized muscle around the hair. And it tightens up when you're cold and makes the hair stand up, which traps a layer of air, insulating factor, against your body. The fact that some animals have more hair, that you don't have any hair on your arms at all? Whoa, wait. Not really. <laughs> I, I see hair on your arm, Wade. You need to talk to your mama. I think you do have hair, okay? Uh, and the fact that we have less hair than apes, uh, what does that mean, okay? We have, we have emus have feathers. They don't use them to fly. I think the goosebumps are great. It does help you warm up. It traps an insulating air, uh, air, air against your skin. So, again, that's not evidence for evolution. That's evidence of design. We were, it's amazing design. Each one of those little tiny muscles, those sphincter muscles, and you have thousands of them, maybe even hundreds of thousands on your body. Each one of those little tiny circular muscle, think about that, a muscle in a circle that attaches to itself. How did that evolve? Why did that evolve? Why do we have goosebumps? You're going to claim it's because we're losing something. That's not evolution. Losing hair is not evolution. If man is the most advanced feature, then we lost a bunch of stuff coming from the apes. It'd be nice to have hair all over when it's cold outside. But we're smart enough to put a coat on. Apes aren't. Wait, if you're satisfied with that answer, you could ask. Go ahead. Have yeah, a well, no, I mean, I was just going to say, you, you were talking about a loss, like losing a feature isn't evolution. But evolution is a change. So whether that's a beneficial change or a, a negative change it's a change so that's that's evolution did you just admit that evolution is true all right so we're gonna jump into well yeah let, let's go ahead and, how are we doing like overall time like what do you we're doing good we're doing good um i think you have what one or two more arguments to present wade let me double check so common ancestry you want to talk about rainbows Oh, and speciation is a really good one. 
So. Okay, let's jump into your argument number four then. We'll allow you to present okay. that, then we'll give uh, Kent a response. So whenever you're ready. Oh, I'll let okay. the audience know as you're pulling that up that I'm all caught up on questions as well. So thank you for tagging me and should be another good audience Q&A. So wait, I see your screen being shared now. And whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. I think I might have... Uh... Well, okay. So Kent Hovind says that 4,000, this is generally what like Answers in Genesis says that there was 1,400 kinds of animals on Noah's Ark. Um, this was approximately 4,400 years ago. Now, <clears throat> so that was 4,000 years ago, there was 1,400 kinds. And today, if we look at just the amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, there's um, over 41,000. And so this is excluding somehow like all of the trees, the fungus, the insects, um, bacteria had no problem surviving a massive worldwide catastrophic event. They did just fine. So we're looking at just, I'm, I'm giving Kent as much leniency as I can. Uh, in a, in our, I think it was our first debate. I talked about the speciation of frogs and how if we look at a exponential growth formula that we would see, we could see like a smooth, gradual um, speciation of frogs or change within the kind. But um, I pointed out that there's a problem because we don't see this rapid speciation today. And so what I did is I did the math for you. You're welcome. Um, what I did is I did an exponential growth for the first half of the time gap, and then I reversed that and did an exponential slowdown. All right, so we have after Noah's flood right here at time zero, uh, there's 1,400 kinds of animals, and then it increases at the, I think, at the greatest increase. It was about 25 species per year, new species. And then it slowly graduals out to taper off. Oh, okay, so it's looking pretty good. Um, and then we also have the generation length model. This is essentially how, so it, it takes into account the lifespan of animals, how often they reproduce. It's basically saying, um, you know, how many babies within a generation can uh, a certain animal have. Uh, and I can measure this with the predicted and the observed um, generation length model. Uh, I also, this was from our first debate, we talked about we can look at a coyote and a wolf and we compare, we can compare their genetics and see how different they are. And then we can look at um, a parent-child relationship and how different that those genetics are. So we can take the amount of change between species and the rate of change within a species to estimate generally how many generations there are. Okay. <clears throat> so if we take our exponential growth and we factor in the generation length model um, and how many gen generations it takes to create this diversity, and we plug that all into a calculator. Well, I mean, okay, you know what? You know what? Let's sprinkle in a whole bunch of miracles, okay? Just miracles everywhere. Species are popping out of nowhere. Um, unfortunately, there's what we call the inbreeding depression. This is basically why it's not a good idea to marry your cousin. All right? So, the Currently today, we have a number of endangered species and they're endangered because uh, for, for many reasons for this uh, inbreeding depression. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, science has done some really interesting experiments where they basically try to um, introduce new uh, genetic diversity. So it's not quite like you're marrying your cousin, right? And there's only one problem. Uh, uh, Noah, he only brought one male and one female onto the boat. 
So our inbreeding depression is absolutely significant. And when we factor that into our equation, it just doesn't work. There's no possible way that 4,400 years ago, give it 100,000 years ago, you can't go from 1,400 kinds of animals to over 40,000 species of animals. Um, yeah, so I will now turn the time over to Kent and you can tell me how, how did this happen? Okay, Wade, thank you for the fourth argument there in your presentation. Uh, Kent, we're going to hand it over to you now. Let's say five to six minutes, whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wade. I appreciate that. Um, there's no way all the animals could come from all the animals on the ark, you said, but yet you believe all the animals and plants and bacteria in the world came from a rock. A hot rock cooled off 3.6 billion years ago. I'll make a graph. I taught a, a, a biology, I mean, a algebra and geometry also. I can make graphs. So I'll make a graph. How long would it take for a rock to turn to a cow? Hmm, how many changes would there have to be? I'll, I'll do some math for you, okay? Try to send it to your next debate. I accept the fact that cows can jump, okay? They have rodeos where they jump cows, okay? They can. So I believe because we see a cow can jump, here's a bull jumping over a six-foot fence. Wow. I believe a cow can jump. Is there a limit? No. Now, if you gave that cow vitamins, took them to the gym, made them work out every day, someday the cow could jump over the moon. That's dumb. There's, of course, there's a limit. Yes, we see variations within the humans and variations within the cows and variations within every kind of animal, but they're still the same kind, recognizable to a four-year-old as the same kind. Cows are never going to jump over the moon. There's a limit how high cows can jump, Wade, okay? Have they reached the limit? Is six foot? I think six foot's the world's record. Okay. Maybe next year somebody will get six foot one. I don't know. But I know there's a limit. They're not going to jump over the moon. They're, are they limited with with dog breeds, have they reached the biggest one now, three foot eight to the withers? That's a big dog. Somebody might get one three foot nine next year. I know this, the further you get away from the norm, the more problems you have. The, the special dogs they've been breeding, trying to get smaller dogs or bigger dogs, almost none of them would survive in the wild on their own. The teacup chihuahua, are you kidding? The squirrels would eat it, okay? The chipmunks would eat the dumb thing. They can't, so the man has created them. Natural selection works, artificial selection works, but it selects, it doesn't create anything. There are 16 common breeds of cattle, but actually 400 different cattle breeds in the world. Might have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. It was a cow, recognizable as a cow. Any kid would say, I'd say was that a cow? Yep. Is that a squirrel? No, 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 a cow. I had a four-year-old go with me today, and well, Freddie's five kids, one of them's four years old. We went up to feed the cows at our farm here. And I pointed to some of the goats and said, oh, look at the cow. He said, no, Mr. Hovind, that's a goat. He's four years old. He's smarter than all the scientists you hang out with. He can tell. 400 breeds of cows might have had a common ancestor. That does not prove cows are related to a common ancestor with humans and dogs and mosquitoes and everything else. Okay. What we see is variations within the kind. Here you are picking on the Bible account because you don't want to believe that book. I know. But it's, it, I believe, more like four or 5,000 or 8,000 varieties of animals on the ark. Whether you had to take frogs or not, I don't know. Frogs can survive just fine in the water, you know. And there are now 7,400 species of frogs, I agree. I think the animals getting off the ark would have a pure gene code. From the pre-flood world, everything was fine. There wouldn't be a genetic load to worry about like we have today. Noah could have married his sister. They could have married cousins in the first few generations. It was uh, after, I forget when they finally outlawed in some states, uh, most states, that you can't marry closer than a first cousin, okay? I think that's wise, but because there will be genetic problems. However, they can still interbreed, can't they, and still produce babies. They're still human, all right? Babies might be, you know, something wrong with them, but it's still, inter still producing. So speciation happens, variation happens, but it's limited. There are now, what, 200 varieties of wheat typically cultivated. Okay, I think they had a common ancestor called a wheat, 4,000 kinds of potatoes. Maybe the leopard and the lion have a common ancestor. They can crossbreed. I don't know if they had a common ancestor. Buffalo and bison can crossbreed. Wow, get a beefalo, oh, pretty cool. Uh, sheep and goat can, they don't normally, but they can reproduce. Sheep and dolphin cannot reproduce. They can't do it, okay? Don't even try. Uh, camel and llama can reproduce, okay? Jaguar and a lion can reproduce. They're the cat kind. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. So to go from 8,000 kinds of animals on Noah's Ark, which did not have to include most of the amphibians, which can survive on floating log mats and the flood debris outside, plus 
I think the flood, Noah was in the ark for a year, but the, that doesn't mean the whole world's covered in water for a year. Parts of the world might have only been covered for a few weeks, just long enough to kill everybody. The crust of the earth is obviously broken up. It would be flexing up and down because the fountains of the deep broke open. Crust is all cracked up. We still have the fault lines where that happened. And the water underneath is now on top. So under, underneath the crust is settling in and re resurfacing, uh, re reshuffling itself around the broken pieces of the earth's crust. And they're stuck together pretty good. Now we've got a few still moving, fault lines, San Andreas Fault, Hayward Fault. And they cause earthquakes and volcanoes. But the flood would have formed all of this stuff, not only the layers, but the flexing up and down, isolating certain animals where, they, wow, they're stuck now. They can only breed with certain ones. And they might develop an unusual trait, like Darwin's 14 kinds of finches that are still birds, still finches. Some have a heavier beak or lighter beak. That was not evolution. That was a variation of a bird. We have 35 kinds of chickens in our farm. Here, you can come see them for yourself. We keep them purposely to teach kids why punk rockers always keep chickens in their yard. Teach the kids how to walk. That's why. So they're still bringing forth chickens every single time. No exceptions. Let's see, 225 species of owls, eight varieties of bears. Might have had a common ancestor. Wade, do you think bears and owls have a common ancestor too? Your chart shows they do. Hmm. So I think all we've ever seen is variations within the same kind. Are there limits? Yes, there's limits. Could they come from Noah's Ark? I don't see a problem with that. You want to pick on that little detail, and yet you believe you and all the life forms came from a rock. Don't you, Wade? Go ahead. Okay, Ken, thank you so much for that response. Wade, we can either give you a minute or so rebuttal, or we can move on to your uh, final argument for tonight. It's up to you. Go ahead, Wade. Yeah, there's one thing. Uh, I want to share my screen. So many varieties of chickens and cows and potatoes. All right, so let me get to this screen. Whoops, I think I went to the wrong page. Let's see. This one. This one. Okay. So um, just this example, we have the coyote and the wolf, um, and we can measure how different they are. And then we can also measure, so each of these dots represent a generation. This is a very simplified chart. But like over here, we have this parent gives, reproduces and produces this child and we can measure that difference. Um, so again, we have the amount of change between, a, for example, a coyote and a wolf, and we can, we can very closely estimate the number of generations. And then as I mentioned in the other slide, that we know the gener how long it takes these generations to reproduce and the reproduction rate to get our time. So when you say, I don't know how many varieties of chickens there are. We'll just we'll just say a hundred varieties of chickens. Okay, if we were to look at their DNA, we would be able to measure their difference between this chicken and that chicken, and we could look at the difference between mama chicken and baby chicken, right? And so we could come up with how many generations did there need to be to have a hundred variety of chickens. So when you talk about, you know, hundreds of varieties of cows, hundreds of varieties of, it takes time for these varieties to, to breed and reproduce. Um, I mean, we've been breeding dogs for, uh, you know, thousands of years and, and we have the, the varieties that we have now today. And so if we look at each different group you know we have another just crazy exponential growth that suddenly just caps you know it so when you when you talk about all these varieties of cows and varieties of potatoes you're really just shooting yourself in the foot because how do you explain the time that it takes for those varieties to come about okay wait thank, thank you so much the... yeah okay Thank you for the rebuttal there. We'll hand it over to Kent now. Kent, go ahead. Let's say between two and three minutes. The floor is yours. 
All right, let me set my timer here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Wade, I appreciate that. Uh, the differences between a coyote and a wolf, you can look at the DNA differences. That's, that's, you're correct, okay? And I think they can make some reasonable assumptions that the coyote and a wolf had a common ancestor, which looked like a dog of some kind. How many differences are there between a wolf and a potato? Could you do a graph for me, Wade, and tell me how many changes it would take for the way, do the potato and the wolf have a common ancestor? Your family trees show they do. Look at that, look at that. A protozoa, turn to everything. Biology teacher, potato, everything, wolf. I think getting a dog and a wolf having a common ancestor and a coyote and a wolf, not a problem. Dog, wolf, coyote, common ancestor, no problem. Which one's not like the others? Uh, the banana. You think a banana and a wolf had a common ancestor? Yes, you do. I'll answer for you. See, this evolution stuff doesn't happen. We see wolves able to mate with coyotes still, okay? They don't normally, they don't like each other very well, but they can. They compete for food is why. Let's see, koi wolf, wow. Appeared someplace in northern Michigan. How about the koi dog? Crossed a coyote with a dog, wow. Koi dog, let's see. Western uh, male coyotes, let's see. Three species and 40 subspecies of wolf. I think they had a common ancestor. There's one in Central and Southeast Asia. Strange looking dog. Still a dog kind. I think all the different, I think they all came from a common ancestor called a dog. Getting off of Noah's Ark. But you believe all these had a common ancestor with a potato. Don't you wait. Anyway, so yes. What's the DNA difference between a potato? I'll do some research. I'm going to find how many chromosomes D potatoes have and uh, how many chromosomes wolves have and see if anybody's done a study on that. How long would it take the potato to turn to a coyote or a wolf? That'd be a good science. I may even get a government grant. Look at that. Well, boys, we can get some money. Yeah, I like that around here. Government grant. The, what would we call the cross between that thing? A wo a wo a wotato. A wolf. A puff. Okay. So yes, I think the variations we've observed within kinds are easily explainable. 19 subspecies of coyote. Okay, not a problem. Coyote, wolf, dog had a common ancestor. 339 breeds of dogs, no problem. Common ancestor. Let's see. Wolf, coyote, jackal have 78 chromosomes. Wow. I wonder how many chromosomes, Google that, Randall. How many chromosomes do potatoes have? I gotta, I'm onto something here. I'm gonna make some money off of this. Man. Okay, so I believe the Bible is correct. God said they'd always bring forth after their kind. I'd be willing to predict if you crossbreed cows, you're gonna get cows. Crossbreed potatoes, you're gonna get potatoes. Every time. No exceptions. Wait, you went from one dumb religion of Mormonism to a dumber one. Evolution. I like to bring it to find the real truth. God loves you. He wants, to, he wants you to be one of his kids. There is a God. You're going to face him one day. I, I hate, hate you to face him the way you are. I'd like to see you get saved. Come on down, Dinosaur Adventure Land. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for that rebuttal. Uh, Kent, Wade, as per the format, are we moving on to your final argument for the night? Or would you like um, a, a short rebuttal yeah. to... Yeah, uh, well, I, mean, I, I was just going to mention, so in the, in the main topic, I was... I wasn't talking about potatoes turning into wolves. I was talking about 14, the 1400 kinds that got on the boat. So I'm talking about like the dog kind turning into the coyote and the wolf and the fox and the and dog or whatever else. In order for that to happen, in order for there to be 500 types of chickens, it takes time. And unfortunately, 4,000 years is not enough time Unless maybe, I don't know. Okay, so yeah, let me turn my screen back on. If we're moving on to the fifth argument, did we want to give uh, Kent maybe a 30 second response to your points um, there? Well, uh, he, he, oh, go ahead. Sure. Okay. I had a family in a seminar I was preaching somewhere. I don't remember where now. I should have interviewed them and saved it. But they said, Brother Hovind, we've been in the dog kennel raise, dog raising business for uh, 100 years. Grandpa started a kennel and we, four generations of dog raisers. She, this lady said, we do this professionally. She said, I promise you, if you give us 30 or 40 generic mutts, pick any mutts you want off the street, let us have them. In 100 years, we can through selective breeding, make all the dog kinds available today. We can turn it into a Chihuahua or a Great Dane in 100 years. All the dog breeders in China got together and said, we're gonna breed a dog for the emperor. Anytime a puppy seems closer to the goal, save it for the next generation. We're working to get a dog that's smaller and loves to do nothing all day. Huh. Nothing all day. Sit on the owner's lap. Very good, Chung Fu, but that one's way too big. We want smaller. Okay. No Bing Chow, hair too long. We want short hair on dog, so lo lo less mess for owner. 
Master, I succeeded. I create a dog that is small, short, hair, has, does nothing all day and night. Some problems come through, Master. We didn't mean for it to happen, but it did. Dog also very stupid and ugly and make funny noises all day and night. Also tongue hang out of mouth on side and drool. I so sorry, Master. Should I keep trying for a small, short hair dog and do nothing? Oh no, Ching Chang. I know some Americans who are also dumb and will buy these for big American dollar. You do good, Ching. American women especially easy to fool, thinking dog is worth big money. American husband who pretend to like dog to keep wife happy. Quietly he knows, dog useless. But he say nothing. Yes, they've crossbred dogs down to the pug, and for, my wife likes it. Only reason I keep it around, she likes it, okay? That's not an improvement. He wouldn't last 10 seconds out in the woods, okay? So yes, variations happen, but they're limited, and most of the varieties are useless. Go ahead. Go ahead, Wade. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, um, one thing that came to mind is this is an example of selective breeding, right? Not what happens in nature, what's not natural selection. So I don't know. It's just like, why, why don't you just say that, like, it took God, uh, I mean, the whole six day creation, it was like two days to create all the animals. Like, why didn't he just? Why didn't he just create all the animals? Or like, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, let's let's go ahead. Well, actually, this might be a it's all right transition. Let's go to the last talking point. Okay, last argument for the night. So, Wade, whenever you're ready, if you're uh, screen sharing, there it is. So I've got it up on screen, and if I am correct, I believe this is our argument five. So go ahead. Yeah. So in one of our debates, Kent said that rainbows did not exist before Noah's flood. And I mean, um, these numbers, I, I forgot to update these, whatever exactly, you know, say it was 4,000 years ago. Well, 3,999 years ago, rainbows totally existed. Uh, so rainbows, pretty simple phenomenon it just takes a little water droplet in the air and sun at the right geometry which happens all the time uh, in fact the size of the raindrop does not directly affect the geometry of the rainbow but mist or fog tends to disperse the effect so whether your droplets are big or small uh, yeah rainbows um kent's explanation is that the atmosphere four thousand years ago was different than the atmosphere 3,999 years ago, for some reason, okay? Um, all right, so a little bit of science. Uh, this pretty common phenomenon that water boils at a lower temperature at higher ele elevations or at lower pressures, right? And in fact, science has very well understood the nature of water in its solid liquid and gaseous states um, depending on what the temperature or the pressure is right so um, like in our in our previous example at a lower pressure down here it's gonna require a smaller temperature for that water to be vapor there's also what's called e um this is the 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 quality of water or the quality of steam. So like within the water vapor section, uh, this is something I learned at college when I was becoming an engineer um, in thermodynamics. So there, there's a whole understanding of how much energy the water has and it basically how, how wet the steam is. And then we also have the wet bulb, um, this is the the dew the dew point of water. Like when does the water droplets form? So we know quite a bit about how water forms, what conditions it can form in in the air. All right. Now something else we also know four thousand years ago before the flood is that plants and animals existed. All right. And we also know that plants and animals require a certain temperature and pressure to exist. Um, or they die. P you know, people who go up on Everest, they have to have uh, assisted oxygen. So that 
considering these livable or the habitable zone of temperature and pressure, that kind of narrows down our window here of, of what's feasible. Um, we're talking about the atmosphere before the flood, you know, see if we can figure out something about it. Uh, we know that plants existed before the flood, and we know that plants, they take in sunlight and give out carbon dioxide, uh, or take in carbon dioxide. And they also require water. Now, I don't know of any other way that these plants would be getting water other than rain. So I'm pretty sure rain existed before the flood. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, these plants and animals before the flood, they required a certain composition of air. So our atmosphere, our air is composed of nitrogen, oxygen, and other trace elements. All right. You can't vary these too much or else things get pretty weird. So before the flood, 4,000 years ago, we understand what the temperature of the earth was, the pressure of the earth or, or the atmosphere. Um, we know that rain happened. We know what the composition of air was closely to, and we know that physics existed. There's a lot of different types of rainbows. There's a fog bow, there's a moon bow, or a, a lunar rainbow. <clears throat> this is, I believe this is the double rainbow. So you have to look at closely at the colors. So on a double rainbow, the color sequence is actually flipped. Um, now this is called a twinned bow right down here in the front. So there's, there's also a double rainbow, but down here it's the same color sequence. And this happens when there's two different sizes of water droplets, small droplets and large droplets. Um, a full circle rainbow, which you can see from high altitudes. You have the supernumerary bow, which is crazy awesome. You have rainbows that form from waterfalls. You have rainbows that form from geysers. So um, a lot of rainbows, and it's a pretty simple, easy phenomenon. Now, my question is, what is more likely that a supernatural deity altered the composition of the atmosphere to remind himself to not commit a global genocide again, or maybe our ancestors had no idea what a rainbow was, and so they came up with a cute story. You know, the, the ancient Greeks didn't understand what lightning was, so they came up with Zeus, or, or you know, the, um, like, what caused the waters to, to storm, and so they came up with Poseidon, uh, all right, so and I, I think you know, ancient ancestors, they said, what's this beautiful rainbow in the sky? Maybe, maybe some supernatural deity, maybe God did it. Um, and I think that is it for rainbows. Okay, Wade, thank you so much. Uh, what we'll do now is give Kent his six minute response up to six minute response. And then we're going to have to make that the final argument for tonight, as we do need to jump into a few audience questions at least uh time has certainly flown by so kent whenever you're ready we'll give you the floor all right i'm extremely curious what on earth rainbows have to do with uh evolution topic tonight seem more like an attack on the bible which is not the purpose of this debate you're supposed to give evidence for evolution that's the title go back and read it okay however i believe the bible teaches pretty clearly there was water above the firmament before the flood came 4400 years ago and probably increased air pressure and under great pressure, lots of things would change. Uh, the oxygen concentration was greater. Uh, according to the air bubbles found in amber, uh, which is petrified tree sap, they're 30% oxygen. Today we're breathing 21% oxygen. You get beyond 32 or 33% and you start to have problems, okay, oxygen toxicity. But 30% would really be perfect for the world to have. For all the breathing would be great. You could run for miles and not get tired. I think God designed it perfect. I think the increased air pressure would prevent the rain from forming. And the Bible says that a mist went forth and watered the face of the ground. I think there were subterranean water chambers that misted forth. And like a, many gardens are watered that way by misting them from the ground, as opposed to, you know, sprinkler hoses kind of thing, as opposed to rain. It doesn't have to be rain. So this has nothing to do with the whole topic of the debate tonight. But since you asked, 
I cover this in great detail on my video number two about what was it like before the flood came? Why did they live to be 900 years old? Why do we find fossil insects that are gigantic by today's standards? Something, they had dragonflies with 27 inch wingspan. They'd have to have compressed air to fly in, which is what a canopy overhead would do, held up by the magnetic field or held up by inflatable building type stuff, you know, air pressure. Uh, so I think you're, you're, you're onto something there. The rainbow didn't form till after the flood, but you gave two false answers. If I said, are elephants, are elephants green or are elephants orange? Come on, choose one. Neither one's right. Okay, you gave two options, both of which are baloney about the rainbow. The rainbow is a naturally occurring phenomenon because of the change in air pressure and the canopy is now gone. You need to watch my video number two, Wade, I'll give it to you. However, nothing whatsoever to do with the flood, or the story tonight. Huge insects are found. Fossil cockroaches, 18 inches long, have been found. Uh, fossil centipedes, six feet long. This had to have greater air pressure so they could breathe since they breathe through spiracles in their skin. And greater, the ones those that could fly had to have thicker air, effectively thicker air. Uh, if you're an engineer, you understand about increasing air pressure, it squeezes the molecules closer together. I can swim through water, I can't swim through air. I can't flap fast enough. But the air, because air is thinner than water. So I think if the air were thicker, that would explain why we find fossils of ginormous everything. Today, the world's biggest beaver is 30 inches long, I believe is the world's record now. They find fossil beavers eight feet long. Something was different before the flood came. I think the canopy overhead protects that. However, nothing whatsoever to do with the topic of the debate tonight. I think uh, the audience, if they're uh, honest judges, sit back and look. Wade offered no evidence whatsoever for why he believes he's related to a tomato. Why all these animals and plants should have lines drawn between them. Why on earth do we make the kids believe this stuff? Why are we teaching the kids in our textbooks that humans and birds and ladybugs have a common ancestor? This isn't science. This is religion. Masquerading as science. All the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. Well, wait, if you believe that science textbook, you believe you're related to a tomato. Yep. Primitive. We came from primitive unicellular organisms. No traces of those events remain. Uh, we don't have any evidence for it, but we believe it. So they make these family trees and have the humans and the tomatoes going back to a common ancestor. I'm sorry. This isn't science. I wish you guys could admit you have a religion. And I wish you would take it out of our public schools and go teach it in private schools. The Mormons can have their own schools if they want. I don't care what they teach in their Mormon school. The Muslims have their own schools. That's fine. Teach what you want. The communists have their own schools. You evolutionists, another cult, should have your own school. Get it out of our public schools. It has nothing to do with science. Nothing whatsoever. Go ahead. Okay, Kent, thank you so much for that response. Gentlemen, let's do this. Since we went through five major arguments uh, for this debate with some subpoints uh, mixed in, why don't we take two to three minutes each in the form of a concluding statement? That way we can wrap up our thoughts and points before we get into the audience questions. So Wade, we'll start with you. Let's say between two and three minutes in the form of a concluding statement. We'll do the same for Kent. And then we'll get into some audience questions. So, Wade, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, okay, I think. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to mention real quick. So, like, why talk about rainbows, right? Um, which has nothing to do with evolution, but the supposed uh, claim that disproves evolution is this uh, young earth creationism from the Bible. So if we can look at cer certain claims of the Bible and and disprove them, then we can, um, you know, give more c credibility to the theory of evolution. Uh, maybe I kind of want to jump into. So one thing that Kent often brings up is his uh, he'll he'll say that like, how do you believe that a tomato is related to an elephant or whatever typically so let me let me share share my screen maybe i can tie this in real quick if you need a little bit more time too, wait yeah. feel free to do so whatever you take we'll I'll, i'm timing and we'll give kent equal time so go ahead so yeah generally kent says that you know you believe an amoeba is related to a whale like that's what what uh evolution is false I guess that's his argument or something. 
Um, but this is, a, this is a bad argument for a number of reasons. So first of all, you have the argument from incredulity, which is essentially, if I were to say, you can fit one million atoms in the width of a human hair. And he says, what? Unbelievable. I can't believe that. That's, that's false. Just because something is unbelievable or hard to understand doesn't mean it's necessarily false. You can fit a million atoms in the width of a human hair. Um, another reason why the argument's not good is because it's an argument from ignorance. That's as similar to saying, there's no evidence for Bigfoot, therefore that disproves Bigfoot, which we know is not true. If that were the case, then that would also disprove God. There's no evidence for God. Um, another reason it's not good is it's a special pleading fallacy. He says a wolf and a dog are related. You know, they have two uh, organisms that have a common ancestor. And But then on the other hand, he says a whale and an amoeba, which are also biological um, organisms, they couldn't possibly be related. Well, why? Why can't? Do you have any evidence to prove that they're not related? And yeah, exactly why? Um, so it's essentially, here's kind of reframing it to maybe make it make more sense. If I were to say, do you believe that this color, this dark blue down here, could possibly have a slow gradual transition to this yellow up here? No way, that's impossible, they're different colors. But if I look at the, uh, the color gradient, the slow transition from this color to this color, you cannot distinguish the difference. This is how evolution works. Each, uh, there's reproduction and the variation is so very subtle, but we can see as we slowly come up this way, we change just a little bit, that it starts to make a little bit more sense. And that's what we have with the tree of life. And how do we, we're just drawing lines on paper. Well, no, no, we're not. We, we can look at, uh, say like a wolf and a coyote, and we can look at their genetics and all the evidence and the, all the uh, observations in nature that we see. And I mean, we've seen speciation occur a, a number of different times um, and so i mean that's that's how they structure these these aren't just nonsensical lines drawn on paper they're lines drawn on paper with a purpose like if i were to draw my family tree i could do some research and i could look at who's related to who and yeah and so it, if we look at um all these different lines of evidence, mathematics and vestigiality, biogeography, and it's just such a clear, obvious picture that an amoeba is related to a whale. And uh, Ken doesn't have any evidence to disprove that, so we should at least remain skeptical. Um, but yeah, if you want to respond to that, we can, and then uh, do a quick conclusion or go into questions. Okay. Wade, thank you so much for that response. Uh, five minutes. Appreciate you. Um, if, if, if we could, we'll consider that uh, your final points and maybe concluding statement. We'll say five minutes. Therefore, we'll give Kent five minutes to respond to any of that and then also sum up his thoughts and points. And that way we can get into some audience questions. So Kent, five minutes, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, I do appreciate, appreciate you doing this. There aren't many willing to defend their religion, and I wish they would, okay? I wish they would understand. As far as a million atoms across the human hair, I believe that. I really do, okay? Atoms are really tiny. Now, you believe all the planets, all the stars, the whole earth, all the hair on all the animals in the world fit into one atom. That I don't believe, okay? The, the Big Bang Theory says something smaller than an atom rapidly expanded. I would call that an explosion all the way out to everything and formed everything today. So you want to put all the elephants in the whole Pacific Ocean in an atom and a hundred million of them go across human hair. I agree. You need to stop and think what you've been taught. Now you mentioned there's no evidence for God uh, because we haven't seen it. This pacifier box here, which you guys, I keep just for you guys who need more time for your theory. Okay. 
it says made in China. I have never been to China, so I don't believe it exists. I've never seen it. This claims made in China. I don't believe that because there's no such thing as China. I've never been there. I've never seen it. That's the logic you're using. You can't see God. You can't see gravity either. Give me a jar of gravity. What's, 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 a, what's a gallon of gravity weigh? Come on, you're an engineer. You don't, well, nobody knows what gravity is. We can tell what it does in the acceleration due to gravity, 32 feet per second per second or 9.8 meters per second at, at sea level. But that doesn't tell you what it is. Who made these laws? The law of gravity, inertia, centrifugal force. Who made the laws? Where's the lawgiver for the universe? You guys don't get it. I'm so sorry. Uh, and you do claim that the amoeba and the, the whale and amoeba have a common ancestor. Your charts show everything related. Everything. This isn't science. That's all. I wish you guys could just admit, you know, we've never seen a shark produce a non-shark. But we believe, by faith, over millions of years, let me get my time, time, more time here, over billions of years, we'll give you trillion, quadrillions of years if you want them, okay? We believe the shark and the fern and the starfish came from a protozoa. You believe that, because that's what you were taught from kindergarten on. Somebody lied to you, a bunch of folks lied to you, and you, you got suckered in, Wade. You believed it, okay? It's wrong. You need to go catch another magic fish out of your river who can teach you the truth that, look, God made the world. You're going to stand before that God one day. There is no evidence whatsoever for evolution. So he didn't answer, but I'll answer for you if you don't mind. You believe Wade is related to a jellyfish and a tomato. They got a common ancestor. That's, I think it's sad that you teach. It's bad enough you believe that, okay? It's really, I think, really bad that you want to teach that to other people. And you pick on the Bible like that's, you said, disproving the evolution. Uh, this disproving the Bible would help prove evolution. Disprove the Bible would give evidence for evolution. What on earth logic is that? This disproving the Bible wouldn't help be any help to evolution at all. If the Bible, if you could prove the Bible's false, I don't think you can, by the way. But if you could prove the Bible's false, why does that prove evolution? That's nothing to do with it. The whole purpose of this debate tonight was for you to offer evidence for evolution. What is the best evidence you have? for why any animal or plant could slowly change to something else. You gave examples of variations within the kind. Sure, variations happen. You're probably different than your parents and grandparents. I'd be willing to bet you had great grandparents. And you could probably do a family tree and find out you're related to me. And all the humans probably are related. But somebody did some research for me. Thank you so much. Coyotes have 78 chromosomes. Potatoes have 12. Hmm. Wade, why don't you do a chart? How long ago was the potato and the coyote? I got them on the chart right here. Potato and coyote, common ancestor, going back to an amoeba. Okay, tell me, how long would that take? How long did it take to turn the, I mean, for the protozoa to turn to a potato and a coyote? I had a good field of research for you. Okay. Anyway, thank you for your attention, and I, I wish you'd really stop and think. You have been really, really duped and brainwashed. You were duped by the Mormons. They're crazy. Joseph Smith didn't have any visions at all, maybe too much alcohol, but... And it's, okay, and it's okay to drink coffee, by the way. It's okay, okay? Um, but if you do, your babies will be born naked. I need to warn you, okay? But so, yeah, so you got duped by one religion, and you flipped it for a worse one, evolution. It's a religion, not science at all. I'll take anybody on on that topic. Go ahead. Okay. They, uh, thank you, Kent. There's a five-minute uh, concluding statement. So you both got five minutes to wrap up your thoughts, wrap up your points, and also uh, conclude the debate. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed this format, kept it uh, professional, equally timed, and I got to say comprehensive. So uh, with that, we're going to move into some audience questions now. The audience has been uh, patient. They've had some fun and we've got some good questions for you both. So, okay, let's get right into it then. Question number one, and it comes in for Wade the Wizard. SFT for the wizard. According to evolutionary theory, when prokaryotes were formed, was the law of monophyly broken when they turned into eukaryotes? Go ahead, Wade. Uh, I haven't I haven't studied uh, that in depth enough. I'm just going to admit that I don't know. Um, okay, thank you, Wade. Yeah. Uh, Kent. If there's anything you'd like to add, go ahead. I agree. He doesn't know. Uh, 
no, the, yes, the law, they, they, take, they say there's a law of monophyly. Once something becomes, you know, something it can never change out of its clade is the way they use it, which is absolute baloney. The protozoa down here, let me get my picture again, right here. Uh, the single cell protozoa is not a starfish or a human or a whale. So it did have to leave its clade somehow, and it had to go from a eukaryote a prokaryote to a eukaryote with a nucleus enclosed in a membrane. Well, that's changing. When did this happen? It didn't happen. Never did happen. They were created to bring forth after their kind. And let's see. Uh, reptiles have always brought forth reptiles. I bet turtles always bring forth baby turtles. I'd bet money on that. And pick something with a short generation time like a protozoa. I don't know what that is. Maybe eight or nine hours. They get, grow up and get married and have babies in half a day. Okay. That's a short generation. Now, you can watch that happen a lot, lots quicker than wolves and dogs, okay? Randy, can dogs mate and have babies the first year they're, and one, first year they're alive? Okay, this is so dogs one year, generation time. Humans more like, you know, 15, 16, realistically, 20 when you can afford it. But uh, so, so yes, we, I, I think uh, the law of monophyly had, had to be broken in their religion. They want it both ways. They want to say, well, things change, but yet they can't change. Dumb, real dumb. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent, for that response. Wade, since the question was for you, if there's a last word that you wanted to make, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I think it's important to know. So like, if we have, if we observe an apple falling, like we hear something and we turn around and as it's falling, we're able to measure it with all our instrumentation. Uh, we could measure how fast it's going, how fast it will be when it hits the ground and it, but like what made the apple fall? You know, was it a little insect? Maybe it was just ripe. Maybe some wind came. Like what happened? What what started it in, in a sense, you know? But like so we can look at um, organisms today and and we can see, oh, yes, we, we see that, you know, wolves and coyotes had a common ancestor through a process of evolution and natural selection. Oh, but like what about way 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 back you know like what what caused this first um branch you know like uh, i don't know it's it's not as important to me um but yeah i guess that's what i'll say on that okay thanks for that final word there away moving on to the next question question comes in from ken rock and ken has a question for kent and his question is what is your actually this wasn't the one i was going to do this one more evolution related ken rock question for ken would you not count mud skippers as a fish growing legs i'm not real familiar with mud skippers other than i would be willing to bet five dollars when they have babies they're always mud skippers they, they're not growing legs are they are we seeing them generation after generation getting longer or are they always producing mud skippers randy you're the fisherman are they still how many kinds of fish are there? I don't think it's possible to know all of them, but uh, I'll do some research on that. But I'd be willing to bet five dollars. That's about all I got. That uh, make it three dollars, okay? Uh, that uh, <laughs> mud skippers always had parents that were mud skippers, and their babies will be mud skippers. I'd bet. I'd bet my three dollars on that. Go ahead. Thank you, Ken. I guess if you wanted to, he had a two-part question. His first one was, what's your proof the layers form sideways? You guys discussed that for a little bit. If you wanted to, you can answer that briefly. Up to you, Ken. Well, I would love to. Uh, the fact that, oh, we see the petrified tree standing up, running through all the layers, proves they did not form slowly, that's for sure. Hello, the tree's going to rot and fall down. So there's thousands and thousands of petrified trees in the standing position, okay? So it's absolute insanity to claim these layers are millions of years different in age maybe a few hours different, a few days different. Watch the video, Experiments in Stratification. At the, at the Navy Laboratory in Colorado, why the Navy has a laboratory in Colorado, it's a little ways from the beach, but they do, okay? Uh, some senator had a government grant, his community more money, I guess, but uh, the, they, they show experiments in stratification with the stratification flume, where they pour sediments into moving water, and it forms eight or 10 layers at the same time. They're forming, they're forming this way, not this way. Watch the video. It's been out for 50 years. Experiments in stratification. Watch my video last, or my, last week. Uh, whack an atheist. I show it. I show part of the video on there. The whole thing's like an hour long. There is just irrefutable evidence. The layers are not different ages. I'm sorry. I know this is your Bible, Wade. 
This, this geologic column is your Bible. I know that. And it's baloney. Just like the Book of Mormon's baloney, you went to another phony Bible, the mm. geologic column. It doesn't exist. The layers aren't different ages. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. Wait, anything you'd like to... Yeah, go ahead. Wait, floor is yours. Oh, man. Uh, so, I guess mud skippers. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a, a, an interesting example, but I mean, like, uh, all all organisms we we have yet to find an organism that is is not showing signs of evolution so i mean it's very there there's never been a parent produce I, at least i don't know in a natural situation where they produce a clone right every time you have a child it's very slightly different and you know if they have multiple children or within the population we have all these different children that are slightly different. Um, and if some of those differences are advantageous to survival or reproduction, then that's that's all that evolution is. I just kind of thinking of like, like mud skippers with, with legs, they're kind of an interesting, like penguins, penguins have wings, but they don't use them to fly. They can, they can use them to swim. So like, is that a, is that a flipper, you know, or like, uh, and then also ostriches have these big old wings. They can use them to cool themselves down, but um, like, why did God design flightless birds? It's just kind of weird design there. Um, and uh, let's see, what's the uh, layers of the earth? I don't know. I feel like we kind of beat that one enough. Okay, thank you, Wade. Uh, question or questions in this case were for you, Kent. We'll give you the last word if you'd like it. Uh, one of my guys checked there are what, 23 varieties of mud skippers? Living. Living. Uh, I, I'd bet my three bucks they had a common ancestor called a mud skipper. I do not think their common ancestor was an amoeba or a protozoa. Okay. So what we see, you're right, Wade, we see variations. You're probably different than your parents. I agree. I'd be willing to bet you both got two arms instead of three or four or five or six. Some animals have eight arms. Whoa. I'd be willing to bet you're, you have great grandparents, great, great grandparents. Humans are the same kind. They're called human. Okay. We are the ones classifying these animals and plants. The plants and animals don't care how we classify them at all. They know what their kind is. And like my wife so brilliantly said, how do they know which one to look for? Here's the poor fish trying to find a female fish that looks like him. He doesn't know what he looks like. His eyes are going this way and he can't, doesn't have a mirror, but he knows what she looks like. How? You'd almost think that was designed if you didn't know better. So the, the, what we see are variations within the kind. There's 339 recognized breeds of dogs. Might have had a common, sure, there's variations. They happen from natural selection or artificial selection in the case of, of the pug. Completely waste of money on that one, but they did. So yes, but they're limited. They're still dog, barely, but they're still dog, okay? God said thank they bring you. forth after their kind. No exceptions to that. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Kent, for that final word. Next question comes in the form of a super chat. It is for Wade the Wizard. G Moose, thank you for the support and question. And his question is, if they can make coal, oil, diamonds, etc., quickly in the lab, then why can't they show evolution in a similar time frame? Millions of years claim on many other things that's proven wrong. Go ahead, uh, Wade. Um, yeah, so there's a, it, it, I think it's Veritasium, but if you just go on YouTube and look for the longest experiment on evolution, it's a really fascinating video, I, and I think uh, Veritasium is the channel. Um, suggest you go take a look at that. But I, I kind of want to, one of the things I wanted to circle back on is the formation of coal. Um, so I, I mean, um, yeah, if I can share my screen real quick. Let me let me get my pages ready here. Because this was this was actually something uh, kind of interesting that I didn't know um, when I was preparing for this. So I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. So yeah, like when you get your energy bill each each month, you know, in a and it says the kilowatts of how much energy you used. There's a very well understood science of energy density, right? So 
that that basically means in so this is um we have energy densities of different materials so like hydrogen has you know this amount of energy in a pound or a kilogram of hydrogen and we can go down to we have uh jet fuel lithium and i think coal was down here i mean there's a, a couple different kinds of coal but we know very accurately and like every time we find coal there's a certain amount of energy contained within that coal and we know um uh, what was this so geologists are very well understand very well how coal is formed and or rather i should say how much biological mass it takes to form coal um so for example to I don't know the exact numbers, but to form a pound of coal, it's going to take, you know, like a, a few trees of organic material just because of the energy density. We know these things. So we know how much energy coal has, right? And we also, this is, there's my chart. So this is, um, I mean, this is something humans have kept track of very closely for many, many years. And you can see here, uh, so like coal, we used 29, over 29,000 terawatt hours of energy in, at this, um, this year. <clears throat> so we've, the point is we've used a lot of coal, oil, and gas. We've, we've burned a lot of it, consumed a lot of it. Now, there's a lot of smart people who've checked the numbers. I, I guess I can... Um, Let's see what else we got here. Okay, well, so the point is we've used a lot of coal and we know how coal forms. And there's um, a lot of really smart people who have done these calculations and, and you can check them yourself. But essentially what it comes down to is every year, okay, and so one full year with all the coal and gas and non-renewable resources that we burn, it would take... 17 is something like six or 16 or 17 earths of organic material if you could so, start winding it down wade yeah yeah so basically a forest has to grow on the whole on every habitable surface of the earth it has to die decompose and that has to cycle over again and, it, and forests take many years to grow so and that's every year we're burning all of this coal and if you run the numbers there's just not enough time for all these forests to grow unless you have millions of years of forests growing, dying, decomposing. So the formation of coal um, and how much we've burned has easily disproves a young earth. Unless God put the coal into the earth. And to that, I would say, why does this, why did he do that? Okay, thank you, Wade. We're going to give Kent a response, and then we're going to do a real quick power round on a couple more questions. Power round is yeah. in real quick, so we can get okay. through a couple. And um, Kent, go ahead if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, an Argonne National Laboratory in Lamont, Illinois, formed coal in one year. There's the article. Uh, article, let's see. Scientists, chemists at Argonne National Laboratory succeeded in making a type of coal artificially in one year. Huh. All you got to do is have more heat and pressure. The flood would do that. As far as the amount of coal in the world, I agree, it's astronomical compared to what's today. Uh, if you t uh, Jeannie Scott at the Ber Berserkley University told me, if you took every plant and tree and bush in the world and blade of grass and squeezed it to make it to coal, you couldn't make all the coal in the world today. She's right. Because what we see today is a world that's been destroyed by a flood. See, 70% of the world today is under water, Wade. Okay? A whole bunch more is under ice. A whole bunch more is desert. No trees growing there. So if the world before the flood was different, more habitable, God designed it to be inhabited, I think it was mostly habitable. Today, it's 3% habitable. 97% of the planet is considered uninhabitable for humans today. So I think they had a very different world. Plus, with the increased air pressure and perfect everything, trees would be gigantic. They find gigantic forests of coal. They find seams of coal in Wyoming 300 feet thick. Giant logs have been found. I mean, really giant. I think everything was different before the flood. 
I think the sunflowers were gigantic, everything. All the plants were huge. It was designed to support life. The flood ruined it in many aspects, but a lot of it's under ice, under desert, under water. So of course, you, there's a lot of coal and not enough plants today to make all the coal, I agree. And the fact that we have an enormous amount of coal to burn down there is evidence for a flood that destroyed a different world. But yes, they can make coal in a go Argonne laboratory, call them up, Lamont, L-E-M-O-N-T, Illinois, on Cass Avenue, 9700 South Cass, write to them and say, did you guys really make coal in a year? They'll say, well, yeah, we're kind of embarrassed we did it, but we, we proved it can happen quickly. Sure can. Yes, coal, the flood made all the coal, Wade, all of it. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Kent. And Wade, question was for you. We'll give you a quick final word. There you go. Uh, where, 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 okay. Um, so, yes, I agree that you can form coal very quickly. But can you grow a tree very quickly in order to form that coal, right? So, like, I don't know how these forests just grew very quickly and then decomposed and grew very quickly. And then, you know, like, there's just to add up. I found, can I, where can I uh, share a link? I don't know if people, if, if you search how many fossils to go an inch, um, it's a very interesting video by Minute Physics. And he talks about, uh, he talks about basically this, this point where it takes a lot of coal. We burn up a lot of coal that came from way much more organic life than could have grown, could have ever grown in a short 6,000, no, a 2,000 year period, right? Because like God, God created earth and then like forests grew like super fast and then the flood came and boom, coal. Not, okay, I get it now. I get it. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, now we're into power round. So I got to at least get through these super chats here and then we're going to wrap it up. So appreciate both of your time for tonight. This one comes in from LWKO, $5 super chat. Question for Wade. Uh, I'll just read it for word for word. Beavers create dams, but do you believe beavers have de intelligences? Guessing he meant the intelligence to know human dams are creations. Any thoughts on that, Wade? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I guess I get the point where, like, you know, because I was thinking, like, there's other intelligent creatures that um, design or build. You have birds that build nests, uh, bees that create hives, um, and humans that create houses. And so, how do we, how do we, how do we walk about on our earth and and uh, like not know that God created the earth? If that's the question, um, yeah. It's a, so, how did like that's that's a lot to unpack. I feel like it's more about um, you know the the nature of God and theism when uh, you know er, earlier we were talking about a, a minor cor correction. Earlier, Kent said that if I were to disprove the Bible that would prove evolution. That's not what I meant. If we disproved the Bible, then that would disprove creationism. Um, and we could still remain skeptical of, of evolution. But typically, like the Bible is this supposed uh, way to disprove evolution. Um, but like, I, I don't know, is the question, how do I how do I know that God doesn't exist. I, I had mentioned um, also we had talked about how I said there's no evidence for God and I misspoke. I said there's all right. I should have said there's no conclusive evidence for God. As I opened the very, very start of this debate, like if we have a, a trial and I brought just one piece of evidence, like a one bullet casing. All right. We might we could say, oh, it was probably this guy. It was probably that guy. Uh, with like evolution, if we look at just homologous anatomy, we could say, oh, you know what? Maybe they had a common ancestor. Maybe God created the these animals, right? So, so that is evidence for God. Homologous anatomy. Okay, I'll, we, I, we, I'm just gonna jump in. We wanted a power round. If you wanted oh, to, okay. 
but I don't want to enter. If you want to wrap it up, maybe. Yeah, yeah. My, my, that's just my main thought is like, um, oh, I was just going to say like homologous anatomy could be evidence for God. Like there's, there's evidence for God. But if we look at the whole picture, if we look at all the evidence, then we cannot form a conclusive uh, evidence or an argument for God. Um, and if there was, there'd be no need for faith. But faith is essential to your religion. Okay, thank you, Wade. And Kent, anything you'd like to add to that at all? I, I do believe beavers have an innate, innate intelligence to create a dam. We have beaver dams on our property here and beavers that live here at Dinosaur Adventureland. Nobody, te they don't go to school at all. But did they build a dam out of mud and sticks that'll last a hundred years? Our engineers go to school for years, build them out of concrete and steel and some of them still fall down. What is this here? Yes, who taught the beaver to do this? It's instinctive. You could take beavers away from their parents as soon as they're born, raise them in a laboratory, give them the nutrients to grow to a beaver, turn them loose in the woods, they would know how to make a dam. Where did this intelligence get passed down? Is this knowledge in the DNA? Our baby calves were born five weeks ago. Within two minutes, they were standing up, looking for the dinner table and knew where to look. How on earth would a brand newborn just coming out of the womb of a cow know to look where the udder is? How do they know this? There are millions and millions of things that are just instinctive. Is this also passed on in the genes besides just the physical features? Yes, to get to the question at hand. I believe beavers have intelligence that was put in there by God. I don't know. I don't know another. I don't think the beaver knows how to eat the wood and turn it into muscle fibers and bone fibers and hair fibers. I don't think he knows. I don't think he cares. He eats some of the wood and he let the rest take it. How does he, does he, does he control his digestive system? No. It's all designed. It's amazing design. How can people not see the design in nature? I don't get it. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent, for that response. Wade, question was for you. Quick final word. Um, oh, whoops. Excuse me. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. We, well, this is a power round. Let's, we can just keep going. But yeah, it was, <laughs> I just wanted to say that beavers don't eat wood. They, they use their teeth to cut down the, the wood. And then in their dams, they, they eat soft vegetation, such as apples, grasses, uh, water lilies, clover, giant ragweed. Anyway, just a fun little fact that beavers don't eat wood. They don't okay. digest it. Yeah. Wade, thanks for the final word. And uh, here's the last one for tonight. Guys, again, thanks for uh, your time to the debaters. Time has flown by. It's been a fun one. And uh, you guys didn't disappoint as this was Wade versus Kent. The saga continues. So here we go. Last question for the night. And this comes in from Samir Farsane, $5 super chat. Looks like it's more of a comment actually uh, directed to you, Wade. So feel free to respond however you'd like to. And he asks or says water formation knowledge can't refute Kent's claims. For example, up to recently, everyone would have found the idea of a 3000 degree black supersonic ice absurd is there is there anything you want to say to that wade yeah i mean so the the whole argument for for rainbows um we we know a couple things before the flood we know that like animals existed we know uh that they needed certain conditions to live in and we know the behavior of water in these certain temperatures and pressures um i i think it'd be i I don't really have the means to do a full experiment that I would like to, but you could take um, a sealed chamber or, or like a bell jar, glass bell jar, change the pressures, increase the pressure, change the amount of oxygen to like, I mean, and by all means, like, well, you couldn't survive in it though, because, because the humans, before the flood were like superhumans, right? I, I don't know. But like you could do this experiment where you change the pressure, temperature, air composition, and then mist some water in there and like, and shine a light and see if it makes a rainbow. Like why? I don't know. I think it would just be easier to say that like God did some kind of magical miracle and made it so that uh, 
we couldn't perceive a rainbow. I don't know. <laughs> but like the excuse that rainbows didn't exist before the flood, just like just say God did a, ma a miracle. Like you don't have to say that the atmosphere was some kind of weird condition. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Thank you, Wade. Uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add to that uh, comment? Well, he made a comment, several different topics here. One of them was beavers don't eat wood. And this is an implication that I don't know what I'm talking about, trying to put me down. I can certainly make a mistake, Wade. Let me just read to you here from beaverworks.org. In winter, when there's little new growth on plants, beavers eat woody fare. They have special bacteria in their gut that can make them 30% cellulose they eat from the plants. Here's another one from uh, westchesterwildlife.com. It turns out beavers actually only eat about one and a half to about one and a half pounds of wood a day. They do eat wood, Wade. Okay. Uh, if I was wrong, I would admit I'm wrong. Now you are wrong about evolution. Will you admit you're wrong? Nobody's ever seen a cow produce a non-cow ever. They never have. Now back to the question. As far as black supersonic ice, I've, not, I've never heard of that. I'll check it out. Very interesting. There are some. See, science discovers new things all the time. I think that's great. When they discovered electricity, like, whoa, what is this? I think it's real handy. I'm glad they did. I use it all the time. But it didn't. It doesn't have anything to do with evolution. And neither does the rainbow have anything to do with the topic tonight. So where's the evidence for evolution, Wade? I'm still waiting to see it. Thank you, Kent. And again, this was the last uh, question for tonight's epic debate, but it was for you, Wade. So let's give you the, the last word. Go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, like I mentioned before, it's true that rainbows and the Bible don't have anything to do with evolution, but um, if we can disprove certain claims of the Bible, then we can create a case for disproving uh, creationism. Um, but which which is typically the uh, at least one of the uh, oppositions to evolution, but. Um, are we going to do, so that was no more questions, right? When are we going to do like a short little conclusion, concluding outro or something? Yes. So that concludes the audience questions, Wade and Kent. Thank you so much to the audience as always. Thank you for being so engaged in these important debates. We've always got questions that could keep us busy for the next day or two. So again, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, let's have some final words, final thoughts. I want to thank the debaters for their time for this debate on evolution is on trial. So Wade the Wizard, let's start with you. Final words, final thoughts. And thanks for doing it. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. I guess the one takeaway, if you take away anything, is, again, if we look at just one piece of evidence, we can possibly form the wrong conclusion. Uh, so, you know, if we look at one piece of evidence for evolution, then we might come to the wrong conclusion. Um, um, yeah, so even if you don't understand or you reject all the evidence that supports evolution, there's still no argument that disproves evolution. To be scientifically minded, you should at least remain skeptical. Kent Hovind has, no, uh, has not produced a single logical argument to disprove evolution, and he never will, because evolution is scientific fact. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like there's great harm in believing in young earth creationism and teaching it to children, because when someone is taught to value faith over facts, they often develop a strong confirmation bias towards feelings and not facts or science. They believe that God created the diversity of life <clears throat> as opposed to what science has actually discovered about the truth of evolution. Those who live by faith often start to value faith, uh, things like faith healings um, instead of proven medical practices. They reject things like tested vaccinations and mask wearing over, uh, over things like prayers and mysticism, thus putting the rest of us in physical health uh, at, at physical risk. Well, Wade, let's not get into too many extra issues that we're not going to be able to discuss, plus issues that on YouTube could you know, not be the, the greatest things to get into. So if you want to wrap it up and, and um, keep it on, on topic as much as possible, go ahead. I mean, 
I guess just generally my main point is that I think it's I think it's not good to let me see hold on well yeah so sorry there's there's a number of different things and I, I won't go over cover them all but in general when when we when we have faith or when we believe in something and, and it, we tend to reject the facts and the science and it can cause uh, some pretty serious harm. Um, but with that said, I'm actually not too worried at all. And that's because uh, statistics, if we look at the statistics, it shows a pretty steadily decline in religion and a growing increase in atheism and acceptance of, of evolution. And why is that? Like, why do we see this trend continuing? And I think it's because of the scientific evidence. Um, Kent said that I was I was taught evolution as a kid and I believed it, but that's actually not true. I uh, I grew up a Mormon and I rejected evolution, and it wasn't until I was um, uh, in my late twenties that I I looked at the science and I studied evolution, and that's when I accepted it. And but yes, I think that this trend is continuing because of the evidence, and I predict that this trend will continue on its path possibly at an accelerated rate. Science will continue to discover the fascinating truths of our universe, including evolution, while the religious continue to value belief in things without evidence. Thank Wade, you. thank you so much for those final words and final thoughts. Kent, over to you. Thank you as well for doing this debate. Thanks for your time as always. And final words, final thoughts. Well, again, 15 topics brought up. We'll try to hit them once. Wait, if vaccines are so safe, go ahead and get one. Why, why, why do I have to to keep you safe? If you're safe, take one. Okay. I don't understand. You said, I don't understand or reject evolution. No, I do understand completely what you teach. I reject it because it's not science. I understand people who think there's men living on the moon. I understand that. They, I understand where the moon is. I understand how far away it is. And I understand that they believe that. And I reject it. It doesn't mean I don't understand it. I think it's not science. It is not science to say everything came from an amoeba and everything, the whole universe came from a dot smaller than an atom. I agree, a hundred, a million atoms will fit across the human hair. It's amazing, isn't it? And each of those atoms is pretty complex too. Little electrons, protons, nucleus, oh, it's amazing. You'd almost think that was designed if you didn't know better. Each atom shows design. But as far as you said, you just simply said several times tonight, well, evolution, it's, it's a fact. No, it's not. Stop saying that. And you said it would harm, do great harm to teach creation. This is insane. Absolutely insane. I think it does great harm to teach evolution. We teach the kids there's no designer. Can you look at a plant like this and say nobody designed it? Can you really not see design in everything from the atomic to the galaxies? Who cannot see designer behind this? I think you'd have to be educated way beyond your intelligence to say nobody designed this. Uh, all life forms came from a random no design. Scotty, beam me up. There's no intelligent life down here. Can you look at that and say this came from a dot smaller than an atom? Over billions of trillions of years of slow incremental changes, it gradually went from a protozoa to one of these or one of these. Do you really think this fit in a dot smaller than an atom? Did this come with no designer? How can you be so blind as to not see, wow, somebody is designing things. I think there's a designer. See, I, I can sit back and marvel at God's creation, and I can say, God, you are amazing. Thank you, Lord. But there's people like you that not only believe there's no designer, but want to force everybody else to believe that. And you think that's advancing science? Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. You, come on, just tell me this happened by chance and came from a dot smaller than an atom. That is what your religion teaches. Absolutely, absolutely, totally, 100% insane what they believe. And the fact that a lot of people believe it and more are being convinced of it is not evidence it's true. It's evidence you have a very effective brainwashing program in place. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, lots of cults, have a very effective brainwashing system. They know how to teach it, present it step by step from age zero to you know age 25. And they know how to brainwash them. It doesn't make it true. And you've been thoroughly brainwashed. How can a person look at this and say, nobody designed it? I think you need to step back and look and say, wow, you know, 
God, you're amazing. <clears throat> See, I can go look at the stars and say, you know, when I consider the heavens, the work, the, the finger, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I marvel. I love the Lord, the creator of this universe. I marvel at him. I love him. I want to go live with him one day. I'd like you to be there too, without the tinfoil hat. But come on up. Wait, he loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. Beam me up, Scotty. So if you want to help our ministry, it's been a blessing to you. So you can go call go drdino.com or 855 Big Dino. I'm extension three. Get calls all day long and half the night. When I get tired, shut it off. If I don't answer, tough. Call me tomorrow. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for those final words and final thoughts. Last thing I'll say, ACV uh, Wade is saying that he'll pay top dollars for the wizard's hat. So there you go. You can auction it off and uh, <laughs> the hat can become famous. So, Kat, Tony, thanks so much. I'll, I'll yeah. give three bucks. That's all I got. I want the hat for my museum here. <laughs> Wade, I'll give you $3 in IOUs. So we'll see if anybody can beat that. Okay, Wade, Kent, thanks so much for the debate. This one was definitely one to remember. Tons of fun. Thanks for the final words and final thoughts. And we're going to let the debaters get out of here. Uh, they have both earned some rest. It was a longer one tonight, but I appreciate it. So Kent, Wade, God bless. And Santa for Thank Truth, you. we'll be back in a second. Okay, looks like um, it's just you and I, and I'm just going to take a couple minutes here to go over some reminders. That was definitely an entertaining debate, an engaging debate. Uh, we went almost two and a half hours, and I still had questions from the audience that probably could have kept this debate going for the next 10 hours. So as always, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions. But uh, with that being said, we do a ton of debates on evolution. So if you didn't get your uh, question asked, and therefore answered in this debate. Just bring it to the next debate that we do on evolution. I believe uh, this year, in terms of the uh, 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge series, which will continue into 2023. So what I'll call it is the Evolution Debate Challenge saga continues. And so I believe this was debate number 51 in this series. We've done about 250 debates overall in the series, in uh, just in general, soteriology, nature of God, debates on eschatology, creation, evolution, ancestry, you name it. And we've pretty well uh, hosted a debate on it. So if you're a debate addict, make sure you're subscribed, share around the content. We strongly believe in here on Standing for Truth, critical thinking skills. And so, um, you know, one of the ways that we uphold critical thinking skills is by hosting so many debates on so many important topics. Um, with that, I do want to go over a couple reminders. And also, um, let me see, I had a couple super chats here saved from logical, plausible, probable, the after show king himself. So he's coming out of retirement. And it looks like he's got a uh, one of his famous dumpster fire after shows that should be kicking off shortly after this debate. So if you're not yet subscribed to <laughs> accordion tv um i don't think i have red hair i think it's i think it's the lighting that i currently have so i appreciate that uh lpp um he's got an after show make sure you're subscribed there he's had a ton of uh highly entertaining after shows with some pretty epic uh moments of uh debate so with that i'm going to go over a couple reminders for everybody. Tomorrow, the fun continues. So it's been a good week of debates. We had Kent Hoven and Ryan Adler kicked off the week. Uh, that was uh, the round two. That was fun. Definitely didn't disappoint uh, tonight, of course. Wade the Wizard, Dr. Dino. I'm working on setting up about four or five more uh, of these evolution debates in the next month or two. So if you are interested in taking the challenge 2023, we want to top 2022. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but I think we can do it. I've already got some huge events set. And so you're definitely 
Uh, gonna want to subscribe so you don't miss the shows that we have coming for you for 2023. And if you're interested in taking the evolution debate challenge, if you're an evolutionist, uh, reach out to me, shoot me an email, and we will. And we will. Um, just looking at the comments here. You guys are always entertaining. So thanks so much for that. And we'll set up your debate. So tomorrow, I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, two gentlemen here, David Preston, Pastor Matt Burse, uh, both well-educated and well-studied on the topic of dispensationalism. So tomorrow is going to be an informal debate. Okay, so this is going to be more of a discussion. I've got questions I want to ask. I know the audience is going to have questions that they want to ask. And so we'll kickstart the show with just some opening words of introduction and uh, opening statements to kind of set the foundation for what we're going to discuss. David Preston, the dispensationalist for the evening. Pastor Matt first, the non-dispensationalist. And so they'll lay the foundation for the show. And we're going to be debating dispensationalism, replacement theology, the church, spiritual Israel. Pastor Matt first, he's written uh, a couple of books, at least on this topic. So he, he knows this stuff well. David Preston, he's debated this topic numerous times. So he knows this as well, which means this will be one to remember, guys. This is uh, tomorrow at eight o'clock. So I'm pumped for it. It's going to be a great discussion. Make sure you are here for this debate. Next week, uh, the fun continues as well. Actually, no, Saturday we have a debate. Uh, Jamie from Studio 215, official YouTube channel, I believe is, is what it is. Him and Luca Medugno, they will be debating the, uh, they'll be debating the question. Patrick and Laura, thanks so much. Um, they'll be debating the question. Is there evidence for large scale evolution? So that's what it is. The great macro evolution debate. Yes, that was um, that picture was taken uh, during my Canadian Secret Service days. So I am a uh, I'm retired from the Canadian <laughs> Secret Service, and uh, and and now I'm a, a younger creationist. So converted. Um, okay, let me look at the chat here. All right, guys, thanks so much. And then next week, the fun continues. I'll be. I'll be debating round two with Grayson. This will be more of a formal debate, the great ancestry debate. Donnie versus Grayson, does genetics support universal or common ancestry? So guys, you're not going to want to miss out on this one. Grayson and I have been doing a lot of prep for this. We want to give you a comprehensive, a technical, and a sophisticated debate. So that will be next week. We've also got... A solid debate here on soteriology. Turretin fan and Charles Jennings. Do all believers persevere? So this will be uh, your classic lordship salvation versus free grace theology. We've got a debate Molinism, uh, Molinism versus theistic determinism. Dan Chapa, he's the Molinist for this debate. CJ Cox holds to theistic determinism. This debate is coming up in December as well. I believe... This will be the first time that we have hosted and moderated this specific topic. So I'm looking forward to this one. It's always good to get new topics in there. Always good to get new faces in there. Uh, middle of December, this one I'm pumped for, is the Lutheran Doctrine of Baptism Biblical. So uh, Jeremiah uh, Nordier versus Mark Gageton. And they're both, uh, they both know this topic well. So this will be a good debate. I wanted to have uh, the great baptism debate for a while. And so this one's coming up. We've got an epic uh, Age of the Earth debate coming up in December as well. Clash of the Titans. So T-Rock and Mark Reed. Also, for those that are interested in the Bible translation debate, I just booked for January 28th, which is my birthday. So I guess this is my birthday present, but we'll be having a Clash of the Titans debate. It's actually going to be more of an informal discussion between Will, Ki uh, Will Kinney, he's a KJV-only proponent, and Dr. Stephen Boyce. He's a non-KJV only proponent. And so we'll be uh, discussing the, the great King James only discussion. So both of them, uh, Will and uh, Dr. Boyce, they know this topic extremely well. They've been engaging it and studying it for years and years and years. So one could say we've got an informal discussion between these gentlemen on um, 
two top dogs in the world of Bible translation. So with that, I believe that's all I have for you. Again, looks like there's an after show, which I may or may not join. I'm not sure. I got some work tonight. I'm also prepping for my uh, upcoming debate on genetics with Grayson, but I'm sure later on, if it's still going, I will jump in. And uh, hopefully there'll be some uh, evolutionists in there to battle it out with. Oh, uh, that's what I want to uh, announce. Mike Ord, one of my favorite uh, flood researchers. We've got a lot of visiting uh, scholars and flood researchers that come in here. John Mackay, the creation guy, Joseph Hubbard, Mike Ord. We've got our team geologist, of course, uh, Professor David McQueen. We've got geologist uh, Sal Jardina. So we've got a great team and we've got a, a great team of visiting experts as well that are here frequently. So I've had uh, Mike Ord. I've been blessed to have Mike Ord uh, on the channel uh, almost 10 times, I believe, giving presentations on just about everything. So him and I have been chatting and we're going to do a show dedicated solely to flood boundaries and, uh, you know, the in-house debate within the world of young earth creation regarding the flood slash post-flood boundary. Mike Ord has done a ton of work on that. And he's addressed basically all of the challenges to the competing model of the uh, flood and post-flood boundary. So that's coming up uh, December 13th. So guys, uh, stay on the lookout. We've also got a Christmas special. End of the month, I believe it's the 21st. The creation research team is going to be here. Myself, George Bond, the team, one of our team flood researchers, as well as uh, John Mackay, the creation guy, Joseph Hubbard. So we're going to be here at the end of the month. And it is going to be a Christmas special that you are not going to want to miss out on. Ashley Myers, I agree. She says she loves Michael J. Ord. I learn so much every time. Amen. Amen. It's always a privilege to have Mike on. And I love that he's always willing to do these shows live where we can interact with the audience, address the criticisms, objections, and challenges. Because guys, you know us on Standing for Truth. We want to leave no stone unturned. <laughs> Laura Anderson says, Uboot. And from my understanding, you married a Canadian. So you're probably uh, used to that word being pronounced that way. So uh, Hurricane Havoc says, Donnie, with an IE, is too afraid to join the after show and debate me on monophily. Havoc, you're the only guy I won't debate. You're the only guy I won't mess with. So um, Born Again RN, Steve Christie, God bless you. Good to see you, my brother. Look forward to having you on uh, in the future as well for a second show on Catholicism, this one focusing on the canon. And uh, I'm also, fingers crossed, I'm really hoping that we get that debate uh, between you and Dr. Robertson Jenis on the Marian Dogmas debate. That one will be worth the wait, I promise everybody. So with that, uh, I am going to shut her down. And I want to thank everybody again for being here and enjoying the show. This was round four between Wade the Wizard and Dr. Dino. And... I believe it didn't disappoint. It was just as entertaining as the first four. And so if you want to have a binge of, um, you know, the Wade versus Dr. Dino debate saga, check the description box where you can find all of the debates in this series. So with that, Standing for Truth is out. God bless all. <laughs>